Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I will call to order this business meeting, this regular business meeting of the Bloomington City Council, Monday, April 3rd, 2023. Thanks for everybody who's joining us here in the chambers, and thanks to everybody watching at home. We will start the meeting as we typically do. Uh, if you could, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, welcome. Hope everybody survived the little spring snowstorm over the weekend. Uh, our first order of business this evening is the approval of our agenda, and our, on the agenda this evening, we have two, uh, in the introductory items, we have two proclamations, one for National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, and the second for Public Health Week. We're going to have an introduction of new employees, and then we'll make an appointment to our advisory board of health. Uh, the consent business, which Councilmember Nelson will take us through, has 16 items on it. Uh, under item four are hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. We have two public hearings. One is on the 700 American Boulevard West pre-development agreement, and other. Uh, the next is on item 4.2, a public hearing on a prohibited nuisance con conduct ordinance. Under our organizational business, uh, we have five items. We'll have a report from our city assessor, Tim Bolger, who talk about our 2023 assessment report. We'll have a budget discussion and update with Kari Carlson, our bud, uh, deputy finance officer. We'll have a discussion about a tree assessment ordinance and payment plan discussion, and then get an update on our 98th Street study that is, undergoing, that is underway now. And then we'll finish as we typically do with our city council policy and issue update. Councilor, are there any changes or additions to the uh, agenda this evening? If not, I will move uh, approval of our agenda tonight. Second. Got a motion and a second to approve tonight's agenda. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And I should note, uh, Council Member Carter is not with us this evening. On our agenda, now that we have it, item 2.1 and 2.2 are proclamations. So I'm going to head down to the microphone here. Every single time. <laughs> As I said, we've got two proclamations tonight. And actually, they're a little bit out of order. One uh, is a proclamation for something occurring this week, and the second is for a proclamation occurring next week. But the next week proclamation is first on the agenda, so we'll stick with the agenda order right now. And item 2.1 is a proclamation for National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. And we've got uh, two of our... Uh, teller communicators, our public safety dispatch folks here this evening, uh, Lizzie Eastwood and Josh Rukert. Uh, good evening and welcome. If you'd like, you can come up because then we can do the grip and grin. And after I uh, read the proclamation, we could do all that. So if you can just get right in behind me to be perfect. This is a proclamation for National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, April 9th through the 15th, 2023. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require emergency services. And whereas when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of first responders is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. And whereas the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the City of Bloomington Emergency Communication Center. And whereas public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services. And whereas public safety telecommunicators are the single vital link for our police officers and firefighters by monitoring their activities, providing information, and ensuring their safety. And whereas public safety telecommunicators of the city of Bloomington have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and care of patients. And whereas in 2022, the city of Bloomington Police Department staffed nine telecommunicators who worked as a team to handle 161,601 phone calls and who entered 66,698 66, computer-aided dispatch events. And whereas each dispatcher has exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job in the past year. Now therefore, I, Tim Bussey, Mayor of the City of Bloomington, Minnesota, do hereby proclaim the week of April 9th through the 15th, 2023, to be National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week in the City of Bloomington in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city and citizens safe 
dated this third day of April, 2023. Uh, we, we've all worked quite a bit and seen the work quite a bit of our public safety professionals here in City Hall. They do outstanding work, our, our police officers, our firefighters. I think one of the toughest jobs that I have seen are the jobs that these folks do. The, the demands on them, the, the stress that is placed on, the hours that they put in, the work that they do 24-7 is just exemplary. And uh, as, it, as the proclamation said, it really is the key to, to what we do. From the first contact from, the, from citizens to the information relayed to our public safety personnel, these folks are invaluable. And I'm so glad we had the opportunity to issue a proclamation and we could recognize the work that you do. Thank you so very much, Lizzie and uh, I'm missing my notes here. Josh, excuse me. Lizzie and Josh, thank you so very much. It is greatly appreciated. I, I really want to thank you for thank the work you. that you do. Thank yep, you thank so you. very much. Yeah. We're going to do a quick picture here. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody like to say anything? Very good. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank Appreciate you. That with you. Thank Thanks. you. And our second proclamation this evening is actually for a week happening this week. We're in the midst of it right now. It is a proclamation for National Public Health Week, April 3rd through the 9th, 2023. Whereas the week of April 3rd through the 9th, 2023 is National Public Health Week with a theme centering and celebrating cultures and health. And whereas the goal of National Public Health Week in 2023 is to recognize the contributions of public health in improving the health of the people of the United States and achieving health equity. And whereas black, indigenous, and people of color populations in the United States continue to experience disparities in the burden of illness and death as compared with the entire population. And whereas one of the city's three objectives in the Bloomington Tomorrow Together strategic plan is to achieve significant improvement in the indices measuring the community's environmental and individual health. And whereas public health professionals collaborate with partners outside of the public health sector, including city staff, first responders, staff from Bloomington Public Schools, and the business community, recognizing that other sectors can influence health outcomes. And whereas efforts to adequately support public health in Minnesota will result in a statewide public health system that prevents disease, protects well-being, and improves the health of all residents, regardless of where they live. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim the week of April 3rd through the 9th, 2023, as National Public Health Week in Bloomington, and call upon the people of this community to continue focusing on inclusion and equity to ensure decisions are made with everyone's health in mind so that we can build a healthier Bloomington dated this third day of April 2023. Now we've got uh, Dr. Nick Kelly, we've got uh, the chair of our Board of Health, uh, Star Sage, they're both with us this evening, if you could please come up. And I was a name short, come on up. <laughs> I'm going to be introduced after this. Ah, very good. <laughs> uh, I th Council Member Carter uh, has talked in her time on the on the council. She's talked uh, frequently how how long you live depends on your zip code in the city of Bloomington. And when we read about and talk about disparities in health and disparities in health outcomes in the city of Bloomington, we see it right there. And the work that our Department of Public Health does every day and has for years, but certainly after the last three years, is greatly appreciated and is uh, is often I think. Uh, overlooked by a, a community that, that works toward health and looks at health but doesn't realize all the work that goes into it behind the scenes for, with our folks in the Department of Public Health. So I want to congratulate and thank you all, congratulate you on this uh, proclamation for National Public Health Week and say thank you for the work that you do. I apologize for not calling you up while I was reading because I kind of figured you were going to talk. We're going to do a quick picture and then I'll hand the microphone over to you. Come on in. Thank you. Very good. Did you say anything? Oh, no? <laughs> oh, here, take that with you. Very good. Thank you. Congratulations. Next up on our agenda is our introduction of new employees, and we have three new employees on my list this evening. Uh, folks from Public Health, from Bloomington Community Access Television, and uh, an internal folks with our mail coordinator, and 
I see Diane coming forward right. to do some introductions for us. Good evening, uh, welcome. Well, thank you, and Mayor and City Council. I'm very pleased to introduce you to three new employees in the Community Services Department. We will start first with our mail coordinator, Nolan Posivio. Nolan joined the city on February 22nd. Nolan worked in shipping and receiving jobs from 2003 until 2017. And then from 2017 until this February, he worked at the VA Medical Center in Minneapolis. He performed housekeeping tasks, drove equipment, handled boxes and supplies, and created a, just generally a positive work environment for coworkers, patients, and visitors alike. You will be hard pressed to find Nolan not smiling, right? His friendly and upbeat attitude just creates a positive atmosphere for everyone around him. Please welcome Nolan Posivio. Nolan, did you want to say a few words? All right. <laughs> well, I will say good evening, Nolan. Welcome. Thank you for uh, thank you for being here this evening, and thank you for being part of the Bloomington team. Glad to see you here. Thanks much. Good to be here. Thank you. All right. And next, I want to introduce to you Patrick Wilson. Patrick began with the communications division in January of 2023, taking on the role of Bloomington Community Access Television Production Specialist. Patrick started his journey into television and media production during his junior year at Park Senior High School in Cottage Grove back in 1988. At that time, he took some of the first high school classes on television production in the state. After high school, Patrick attended Hennepin Technical College earning a diploma in television production. Patrick got his feet wet working at WDIO, WIRT Television in Duluth, he then moved back to the Twin Cities when he, where he worked for Burnsville Egan Community Television for 12 years. Please welcome Patrick Wilson. Did you want to say anything? Sure. All right. <laughs> wow, a shy group. Well, welcome, Patrick. Thank Glad you. to have you on board. Welcome. All right, and then finally, you've seen her. Now you'll be formally introduced to her, Areen Babakani. Irene joined the Public Health Division as our new Assistant Public Health Administrator on February 6th. Irene has a background in public health and a passion to serve the community that she lives in. Most recently, Irene worked at the Centers for Disease Control Foundation, specifically in COVID-19 workforce and vaccine efforts. Throughout her career, she has served in various leadership roles in public health-focused nonprofit organizations. Irene was born and raised in London and moved to the U.S. in 2003, and recently she transferred to Minnesota from California. Irene tells us she's been enjoying the beautiful nature in the city's cultural gems, and she is excited to discover more. Please welcome Irene Babakani. Well, I'll break. Oop, I'll, I'll break the. I'll break the trend and say say thank you, uh, Mayor Bussey and Council members. Thank you, Diane and. Um, in the two months I've been here, I've been really inspired by the work that um, the Public Health Division is doing. It's incredible, and I've really been very lucky to have a leader like Nick, who's been guiding me throughout the way. So thank you, and I'm happy to be here. Well, welcome. Thanks much for being here. Uh, Irene, Patrick, and Nolan, great to have you on board. It really is. Looking forward to, uh, now that we know your names, we'll be sure to stop by and say hello and say hello to you in the halls or wherever we might see you. So thanks very much for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up on our agenda, the final piece uh, under our introductory items is uh, an advisory board of health appointment. Uh, we have an opening in, advisory, in the advisory board of health. As you know, we, we made those recommendations and the appointments back in March. And already we've got somebody who has a conflict and is not able to fulfill their role on the advisory board of health. And so we are we, we need to um, fill that, that vacancy. Now we had, back in March, we did have four openings and we had five applicants. And we reached out to uh, the applicant who was not selected and asked if he would, that person would be interested and that person was interested, so that person did apply. And as I go through here, uh, Annabelle Kornblum uh, was the candidate who was not applied, uh, who was not appointed, but again had applied and was uh, up, uh, amenable to being part, to being the appointment. And um, so, Council, if uh, based on the fact that she, Annabelle was the uh, basically in the hole, she was on deck with the uh, the four folks that we have appointed in March and is now is willing to serve. Um, uh, I would uh, move that we appoint Annabelle Kornblum to the Advisory Board of Health uh, 
for a, I believe it's a three-year term, but I can't say that for certain. Second. For one-year term, excuse me. Yep. One-year term, my apologies. Then I'll second that one-year term. One-year term, all right. Uh, so to clarify, to appoint Annabelle Kornblum to a one-year term on the Advisory Board of Health. And a motion and a second by Council Member Lohman. Any other discussion, Council? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Congratulations to Annabelle, and welcome to the Advisory Board of Health. Moving on to our consent agenda this evening. Council Member Nelson has her consent agenda. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, if I might, just quickly on one of your proclamations, do you mind if I make a quick statement on that, the public health one? Please go ahead. So I, I had the opportunity last week uh, as acting mayor to, uh, to present to the um, legislature a bo our bonding request and was very privileged and honored to do that to help public health. So I just want to emphasize thank you to our entire team there. Uh, we know the situation um, and we are working diligently to help out there for the good work that you all do. So just wanted to bring that up. So thank you for the indulgence. Sure. Absolutely. Um, with regards to 3.1, um, I will hold, or three, uh, all of the threes, um, I will hold 3.1. I believe that uh, 3.16 uh, is going to be held um, by the mayor, and I didn't hear of any other holds. Okay, with that, I will um, move to approve 3.2 through 3.15. Second. Motion by Councilmember Nelson, second by Councilmember Lohman to approve uh, the consent agenda 3.2 to 3.15 as stated. Any further council discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 6-0. Councilmember, maybe we should start with 3.16 and then double back to the resolution uh, or with the donations. Yeah, sounds right. good. Uh, so to let, uh, I held 3. 16, uh, this is the uh, Polar Semiconductor Job Creation Fund Application Support Resolution. We talked about this. I think the council talked about this a couple of meetings back. I wanted to pull it uh, just to let you know that I'm going to recuse myself from this vote uh, because of my association with a, a competitor of Polar Semiconductors. But uh, what I'm going to do, unless there is council discussion on this, I'm not going to step away. I'm just going to hang out here and we'll call the vote and, and we'll move on. Unless the council is going to get into some discussion on this, if that's the case, I'll head to the back room. So if everybody's clear on that, that's that's where we're standing. The only question I have, Mayor, is do you want me to call the vote? Then I think that'd be I'm fine. Continue to be acting mayor. Okay. Sure. Just, just want to clarify. So, um, is there any discussion on the item? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. I think, Mayor, I'd I'd, I'd like to move. Uh, to adopt a resolution regarding the support of a job creation uh, fund application in connection with Polar Semiconductor LLC. Second. Uh, hearing a uh, motion from Council Member Lowman and a second from Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. 3.16 uh, passes. I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Nelson. See, uh, and then we'll go back to you <laughs> with item 3.1, the resolution to accept donations. It reminds me of my week as acting mayor. <laughs> the, the power went to my head. <laughs> so, um, again, uh, one of the, the uh, true joys of the uh, having the consent agenda is when you get the donations. And so I would like to thank uh, people for their generous donations to our uh, police department. We had uh, people uh, donate food, T-shirts, and someone make a uh, donation to the K-9. There is one item I'd just like to, just for clarification, put out there that there's a donation for a significant amount, about a little over 49000 from the uh, Metropolitan Airports Commission for us to get a some kind of cool robot that we will use to help uh, at, with safety at the airport. Obviously a big issue for, for travelers within the region um, and our good partnership with them allows that type of thing to happen. We also had a dozen people donate um, to the needle workers, to the wood shop quilters and not to be mistaken for the quilters but also the library quilters, which I assume is similar but at a library. Um, and it was things like yarn, fabric, batting, books, magazines, knitting needles, and um, all of those types of things that people need, including something I was completely unfamiliar with and continue to be unfamiliar with called fat quarters. 
I, I don't know what those things are, but uh, that's because I, I'm not generally very good with hobbies. So um, someone can explain that to me later. But with that, I, I just want to, again, thank people in the community for their generosity with these donations to the police, to our uh, various programs within the community that people really rely on to connect and, and build, our, uh, build the community around here. So I would, with that, move item 3.1. Second. Motion by Councilmember Nelson, second by Councilmember uh, D'Alessandro to accept item 3.1 and the, adopt the resolution to accept the donations as listed. Any further council discussion on this? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilmember uh, Nelson, I think that the books went to the library and the fabric went to the quilters, and I think they're two separate things. I don't think there's a subsection of quilters called the library quilters. As, that's how I read it anyway, but I, either way, Hopefully, hopefully they're having fun reading about quilting. Maybe <laughs> that's what's happening. <laughs> All said. Clarification Thank you. accepted. Thank you. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed. Aye. Motion carries six zero. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. We'll move on to item four on our agenda: our public hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. We have two public hearings this evening. Our first is uh, a public hearing on 700 American Boulevard West, the pre-development agreement that the city has. Uh, we'll be hearing tonight from Mike Palermo from our Port Authority, who has all the details on this, and I know that because we talked about it at the Port Authority. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. I'm here today to talk about 700 American uh, Boulevard West. This is a pre-development agreement. So to give you a little context of where 700 American is uh, by the REI, that kind of pad site, you think you would miss it, you can drive right by, but there is a two acre site located right there, it's zone B2 currently. Uh, we have top line credit union being constructed currently to the west there and Goodwill to the east and Toro Kitty Corner. And to give you a little background on uh, why the city owns this site. So uh, way back, uh, almost 20 years ago now, we had a uh, right of way for uh, American Boulevard project and we acquired nine parcels. And after we did that uh, project, we ended up with two parcels remaining uh, that we then sold. Uh, we sold that to Frown Chu, uh Company to do uh, a credit union which ultimately was top line credit union being constructed now. And they were going to do a medical office building on 700 American, uh, the site we're here to talk about. Uh, it kind of went through a couple of variations. Project kept getting smaller and smaller and eventually Frown Chu realized that it wasn't gonna work. So the city exercised its ability to repurchase the property, which we did uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, we held it for a little while and then we put in another request for proposal out for a developer to develop the site. And in 2017, we uh, was entered into agreement with hy V. Uh, they were looking to do kind of a smaller format grocery store, about 14,000 square feet, a, a health market, a newer concept for them. And as they kind of got into it, uh, negotiations had eventually stalled as well. So the city uh, continued to con remain uh, owner and the property still is vacant. So after that kind of failed attempt to develop, we did some market studies. We uh, worked with Ellers uh, to do some kind of both market studies and concept designs to see what would be a good fit for the site. The Lindell Avenue retrofit kind of reaffirmed what we thought for the site that it would actually kind of work as a mixed use site. Uh, and as council knows, this is a gateway to the city. Lindell Avenue is a, a high corridor, traffic corridor that people enter into the city. So we wanted to highlight this as a, a feature uh, as you enter the city. Uh, we put an RFP out uh, on September 7th. It closed on November 1st. Uh, we didn't put a whole lot of detail in what we wanted. We said we would prefer mixed use, but we kind of kept it open. Uh, but we did really hit home that we want this to be a gateway feature, that this is something that we want people to see and kind of think of Bloomington as they enter. Uh, and then obviously work with adjacent sites uh, if possible. So that RFP closed on November 1st, and as uh, most of you would remember, on December 5th, we held a closed session to review uh, two proposals that were submitted. 
Uh, council at that time directed us to enter negotiations with Schaefer Richardson. Uh, then they moved quickly because uh, it, the property is in a qualified census tract for 2022, but not 2023. But we passed a resolution to kind of lock that qualified census tract in, which is important when applying for low-income housing tax credits, which this uh, proposal is expecting that they will apply for. Uh, so on December 19th, you all passed a resolution in support to kind of lock that in. And then as we move forward in the project, March 21st, the Port Authority uh, held their meeting and adopted a resolution of support for this pre-development agreement that was in your packet. And that brings us to today, where uh, we're here to have your uh, support, hopefully, for the pre-development agreement. So the parties of the pre-development agreement will be the city of Bloomington as the site owner. Uh, and the Port Authority will act as project manager, knowing that this will likely have some financial ask and some negotiations that happen uh, that Port Authority will, uh, will start taking on. Uh, this project originally started with the HRA, but as the HRA transitions to smaller size development, the Port Authority taking these larger housing developments on, it was a natural transition to have the Port Authority take this on and manage it. And then the, the developer, Schaefer Richardson, a little about them. They bring 27 years of experience in commercial, residential, and mixed-use development. Uh, they're a little bit newer to the affordable housing side, but they've got three open, complete buildings that they've been managing, uh, which adds to their portfolio of 3,000 uh, multifamily units that they have. And then they're working with Urban Works as their architect, which has over 17,000 units that they've constructed and have won multiple awards. So the pre-development agreement, it's... For the most part, there's some boilerplate stuff in there, um, but it does outline kind of the goals for the project and uh, some key milestones or expectations of the project as we start moving into other phases. So for one, we say up to 153 units with 5,000 square feet of commercial space, and we expect this will likely change. Um, you'll see those changes as this will require a rezoning and go through the normal entitlement process. There are some constraints with parking and some access, and they're working with our planning staff and engineering and fire department on how to uh, best handle that and potentially working with the site next door to see if there's any way to kind of address some of those, some of those needs. Uh, so that'll come to you at, uh, at hopefully midsummer here. Uh, I have a timeline on the next slide. Uh, like I said, uh, the likely some financial assets likely apply for TIF, uh, tax increment financing. They will be applying for tax credits. Uh, this may take several rounds. The, um, there is a cycle to tax credits. They start right about now, and um, the application is due in July, and then. Um, there's kind of a, what they call like the cleanup round later in the year for when projects that maybe were awarded but aren't able to move forward at this time, then that money flows to other projects. So uh, this will, might take several rounds. It's not unusual for that to happen. And then apply for other grant sources to help fill those funding gaps. And the pre-development agreement also outlines that we would like to see a neighborhood meeting sometime before the entitlement process is complete to get the neighborhood feedback and kind of help influence that final design a little bit. So project timeline, uh, now until fall, like I said, they'll be going through their entitlement process, the, the rezoning. Currently, there's a parking study underway to just uh, identify what the actual parking needs are and other um, things that go along with that. And we anticipate, you know, midsummer by fall, they'll have that neighborhood meeting because the entitlement process will hopefully be wrapping up towards fall time. At that time, when we have more of a final idea of what that design will look like, we can then start doing the financial feasibility and the analysis of what um, sort what gap there might be in their their project um, and what grants they'll apply for and tax credits that they'll be applying for. We hope by the end of this year we'll have a term sheet um, and then that kind of leads to a, a formal development agreement. So this is kind of that first step because we don't have some of those details that a development agreement has, but we want to acknowledge that we are partnering with Schaefer. And so by January 2025, we hope to sell the property to Schaefer Richardson. Um, that seems like a long way out, but like I explained, those tax credits come in rounds. So if, um, a lot of times, you know, if they're applying this round 
and they're not awarded, they can apply in multiple rounds, but it's, there's only two rounds per year. So this gives them kind of three full attempts to uh, really go through that process. And if by the third time, by late 2024, they haven't been awarded, then we know that they're probably not gonna get the low income housing tax credits and we'll look at plan B. But that's why it's kind of that long time frame. Most of the work will probably, on our end, will be done more this year, but it will be dependent on that, um, the award on low income housing tax credits. So with that, I can answer questions or there is a recommended motion. Thank you, Mr. Palermo, I appreciate it. Council questions here? And just to let you know, the, the uh, I appreciate the answer about the time frame because that was the first question that I asked the Port Authority was that seems like a long time to wait to be all the way in 2025 before we get to the sale of the property. But as Mr. Palermo explained, it's the, just to fit into the cycle of, of potential tax credits to try and give them the best opportunity to make sure that they can receive those in this project. Any questions? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nice to see you, Mr. Palermo. Um, so is, as part of the pre-development agreement, we're not making any uh, specific conditions to the property, is that right? Uh, beyond the fact that, you know, they hope, we all hope it goes smoothly to get all of this financing organized. Yep, Mr. Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, there, there's no uh, specific conditions on the uh, actual development of the site on kind of the what the project will look like. It's more kind of details. There's a right of entry agreement so they can do kind of their prep work, um, that neighborhood meetings in there. So just some project expectations, but not into the details of the actual design of the building. That's That will happen with the, on the planning department and go to the planning commission and then city council. So you'll see have that opportunity to see that development as they submit their formal application for entitlements. Right, great, thank you. Also others? Seeing no questions, uh, this is a public hearing. And I will open the public hearing on item 4.1. Public hearing is regarding the 700 American Boulevard West pre-development agreement. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.1 this evening? Mr. Sable, is there anyone on the phone? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, no one on the phone. Last call for anybody in the chambers? Council, no one coming forward in the chambers, no one on the phone wishing to speak to item 4.1. I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing on item 4.1. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0, closing the public hearing. Council, any questions on this? Uh, I do believe it got through the Port Authority with a, on a unanimous vote. Uh, we did have some good discussion, asked some of those questions that I think were answered in this presentation. And um, I think it's... It's, a, uh, it, it's going to be a good project to fill a, a parcel of land that has sat vacant for too long, I believe. Anything else, Council? If not, I look for action on this. Mayor, I'm happy to move. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will move that we adopt the resolution approving preliminary redevelopment agreement with the Port Authority and SRPB Strategic Housing, LLC. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to adopt the resolution approving a preliminary redevelopment agreement with Port Authority and SRB, SRBP Strategic Housing. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much, Mr. Palermo, appreciate it. We'll move on to our second public hearing of the night. This is item 4.2, a public hearing regarding prohibited nuisance conduct ordinance. Ms. Mandersheid. Thank you, Mayor members. I uh, was asked to put this ordinance together in consultation with uh, staff. Uh, we um, lawyers are sometimes ac accused of dancing on the, the top of a pin, um, and some might think this is true. Um, uh, in this instance, um, we became aware of, uh, of a little bit of a difference in language when we were analyzing um, the trespass ordinance, or excuse me, the trespass statute in state law. And so we decided to take the opportunity to conform our specific city code language to the language uh, in state law. So you'll see in your packet, um, I, instead of doing a like a parsed out uh, strike through, I just struck out the whole sentence so you could more easily understand the edit that was happening there. So um, this will now conform our law on, in our city code to match that in 
uh, state law. I would characterize it as a conformity ordinance. It seems to be a conformity, a kind of cleanup, just to make sure that we are in conformance with, with state law. Council, any questions on this? All right, hearing none. This is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing on item 4.2. This is regarding the prohibited nuisance conduct ordinance. Is there anyone in the council chambers wishing to sp speak to item 4.2? Mr. Sable, do we have anyone on the phone? Uh, Mayor and council members, no one on the phone. Last call for anyone in the council chambers. Seeing no one coming forward, council, I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.2. So moved. Motion by council member Lohman, second by council member Nelson to close the public hearing on item 4.2. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Council, any comment or questions on this? Otherwise, I would look for action. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, a quick quick clarification and then I'll happily move the Please. comment. Um, is there a, uh, is this, does this need to also, uh, I know we give trespass notices via police action. Does does this need to be updated there too? Um, or did we, was it all raised fine and we just needed to update our code? Uh, Mayor okay. members, uh, this, uh, we will certainly analyze those. Uh, there's a process by which we need to go through with the police department once we have made a change to our city code that relates to the criminal code. So we have a process in place that we always go through whenever that's the case. So we'll analyze everything. We also um, will meet with uh, the police department. Typically we'll do a roll call notice or we'll talk to the chief and uh, the deputy chiefs about this just to make sure everybody's on the same page procedurally. Uh, and that they're using the updated language. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you for that. I, I happened to be uh, on a ride along, and there was there was some ambiguity here. So it's great that we're cleaning that up. I think everybody, including anybody who might be handed a notice, will appreciate the clarification. Okay. And with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and make Please. a move here. Okay, great. I move to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 12 of the City Code related to public peace and safety. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Merton to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 12 of the Code related to public peace and safety. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much, Ms. Mandersheid. We will move to item five on our agenda, our organizational business. And item 5.1 is a report on our 2023 assessment. And assessments were just completed, and I think everybody should have gotten one in the mail. I'm sure you probably did. And uh, we have our our new, well, not new, but first time new making this report to us. Uh, Tim Bulger, our city assessor, is going to uh, update us on what we learned through the assessment process this year. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. Could, could I ask you to get right into a microphone? Oh, yeah. e either, either move the microphone to you or to, to you to the Let's do that. How's that okay. sound? That's better. Perfect. All right. As mentioned, I'm Tim Bulger, the city assessor, and I'm here to report on the 2023 assessment uh, and assessment report. So we published this report every March-ish. It went live last week on the 28th on our website. There's a lot of good data in here, and the, a lot of it is tailored to internal and external users that put it in other reports or or things of that nature. So um, it may not be the most thrilling information for the council and our residents tonight. So I'm just going to talk some high level uh, statistics that would be of interest to everyone here. And I'm also going to spend some time talking about what goes into the assessment rather than what came out of it here. So uh, I think that'd be a good use of my time this evening. Let's figure out the clicker. All right, so here's the outline for tonight. Um, basically, I want to talk about what does the assessor do or, or what goes into our assessment. And then I want to talk about the assessment timeline. It's, it's very lengthy and confusing for some. And there's a few items under that I'll, I'll discuss in more detail. And then finally, I'll get to the market update, uh, what we saw in the 2023 assessment, what changed from 22. And then I'm going to talk about property tax in general and some programs available for refund or deferral. So what does the assessor do? Um, our duty is very statute driven. Uh, we're, we're tied to that on, on many things. So the uh, primary objective is to value and classify property as of January 2nd each year. And that date's very important and you'll hear me say it many times through this presentation. 
Um, in general, there's three approaches to value, and, and this is speaking in appraisal terms. There's the cost, the income, and the market approach. The cost is valuing the land and then valuing the structure separately based on the cost to replace the structure and applying a depreciation to that. The income is what it sounds like. You look at the net operating income of a property, and then you apply a capitalization rate to determine the value. And then the market approach is looking at similar sales of, of the subject property and then making adjustments to that sale price to determine what the value is. Now, in assessing terms, we do what's called mass appraisal. We don't have the time or resources to take these approaches on each individual property, so we would do it in mass. And we use something called a market-indicated cost approach, which is a blend of co uh, the cost approach and the market approach. So we take our, our basic cost tables, and that's our starting point, and then we look at the market influences over the course of the year and make adjustments to those tables. And that's where we get our values from. So. What goes into the assessment are these three main cyclical tasks we perform. The quintile, which is what it sounds like. Uh, we review in, in thorough detail 20% of the properties in Bloomington each year. That amounts to about 6,200 parcels reviewed. We're looking at land, size and characteristics, um, exterior, interior characteristics of buildings, looking at uh, permits and, and any changes that may have occurred since the last time we reviewed the property. And that takes up most of our summer, as you imagine, with 6,200 parcels to look at. Uh, we're probably spending May through September on this process. Then we have permits, and, and I put 1,800 here because that's, that's about what we look at, and we only look at value-adding permits. We get about 5,000, and a lot of these are closed out on the front end for our purposes, like if you replace a, a water heater or you replace a gas oven and you need a permit for that, um, we know that's not going to impact your assessed value. So, so we don't bother looking at those types of permits. What we're looking for is remodeling permits, um, basement finish, new construction, things of that nature. And so we, uh, we do that process October through December of each year. Um, the purpose of doing it at the end of the year is we have to value what was there as of January 2nd. So if the permit is 50% complete, we need to add that amount of value for it and so on. So we do that at the end of the year. And then the sale review occurs throughout the year. And for the 23 assessment, this is sales that occurred October 1st of 21 through September 30th of 2022. So those 12 months of sales are really what goes into the values that, that we submit. So um, there's about 1,500 per year we look at. And we're reviewing those essentially to determine, are they arm's length transactions? Were there any adjustments that need to be made? And, and can we use these for our modeling? And so those are the three cyclical tasks we perform. And then we manage appeals at all levels once um, those values go out. We field phone calls. We do local board appeals. We do tax court appeals. So that's a, a big piece of the process as well. And then finally, what we do is provide data to internal and external customers, like the assessment report, like this presentation. Um, we speak to realtors, brokers, appraisers, uh, assessors from other jurisdictions, provide data, answer questions. So this is a bit convoluted, uh, and I'm not going to try to use the laser pointer here, but um, this is the assessor's timeline. And that middle orange box indicates January 2023. That's our assessment date. So you'll note the 12 months of sales that went into that. That's the orange box to the left, October of 21 through September of 22. And then you'll notice the orange box on the far right. And that's um, property tax statement comes out in March of 24 for the value we set here in January of 23. And then you finally pay those taxes in May and October of 2014. So at the end of the, the timeline here, October 21 to when you finally pay your taxes is October 24. It's a three-year process. Now, there's a lot of stuff in the middle there that I'll go in more detail. But, but some of the key things are that quintile I mentioned, that's May through September of 22. The permits, October, November, December of 22. Then we set the assessment. Then appeals are really March, April, May, and June of 23. Um, and then there's some other dates on here that I'll go through in more detail on another slide. So time trends, um, I was going to spend some additional time on this one, but, but for brevity, I'm going to keep this short. I think what, what people should know for time trends is essentially when we set our assessment, we need to use the sales and compare them to the value of January 2nd, 2023. So if your sale happened at the beginning of the sales study period, October of 2021, if that house were to have sold on January 2nd of 2023, you would imagine that would be a different price in the 15 months that occurred between then. So the Department of Revenue determines what that percent should be, and then we apply that percentage to the sale prices. 
So they initially determined 7.55% appreciation was the correct number, and we determined that was not the correct number, and so we appealed that time trend through Hennepin County on a larger scale appeal, and the result was 2.55%. And now why this matters is essentially we, we had to bring properties up less than we would have if we'd stuck with the initial time trend. That was saying, you know, if your sale happened 12 months ago, it needs to go up 7.5% instead of 2.5%. So that, that saved um, our residential values from increasing at a higher rate than they should have. And the basis for this appeal really was the changing interest rates that happened over the last 12 months. And I have that chart um, available later on in the presentation. So I'm going to skip the example on the right side, but, but that's the gist of it. That home with the original prescribed time trend would have been 345, 800. Instead, it's 327, 300 was the resulting value. So valuation, one second. So what goes into our valuation, um, there's some fairly strict rules and regulations we follow. Uh, statistical, statistical measurements that are important is that our median ratio needs to fall between 90 and 105 percent of each of the segments we're graded on. And this means the 2023 assessed value divided by the time trended sale price. The segments we're graded on are apartment, industrial, commercial, residential on water, residential off water, and then aggregate residential. And so they give us those segments that they're looking for 90 to 105 percent. We always target 95 percent. And then we stratify these much, much further than what's prescribed by the Department of Revenue. So if you look to the right, these are the residential stratifications or some of the ones that we look at, and we're targeting 95% on the majority of these where it makes sense to target that. Um, again, if you don't have enough sales to, to infer a statistical relevance of that, that stratification, we, we don't go with it. But um, Typically, district or neighborhood code will want to make sure those make sense, quality of home makes sense, style of home, and so forth. So we have, have these median ratios we need to meet. Then we're also graded on measures of uniformity and vertical equity, which essentially is saying, are your low-value homes overassessed versus your high-value homes or vice versa? They want to make sure that the assessment's not regressive or progressive. So we're graded on that. Uh, we get everything lined up to where we think it should be. We do dozens and dozens of iterations of these values internally and have other people review them. Then we send it off to Hennepin County. They do the same checks in their own way. And then it goes to the Department of Revenue where those checks are performed again at a higher level. So um, needless to say, this, this takes a lot of time and effort and, and we're pretty confident in the results of the assessment because of these checks in place. So appeals, uh, as I mentioned, value notices go out in March, March 8th was the date this year. Uh, then we field calls and then formally address appeals. This is a great opportunity for our office to build trust with the public, explain our process. How did we come up with that value? What's selling in your neighborhood? What's the timeline? How do property taxes work? You name it, we answer it. Uh, to date, we have fielded 340 calls. 207 of them were value related. The other were general questions about property taxes, homestead, etc. Um, so, so we take this opportunity and try to spend time with our customers, explain the process, make sure they leave the conversation feeling more informed than they started it. They may not agree with what they heard, but this op opportunity um, it exists to kind of educate and then also we can address the values. As, as I mentioned, it's a mass appraisal process. The models don't fit every single property. Uh, we do make adjustments to value during this time. And some of that is because we haven't been in the house for a long time or something specific doesn't match our models. But we do go through this process and we do change values. And I think it's important to have that check in place. Uh, so after those informal discussions, if we don't come to an agreement, you can attend the local board of appeal and equalization. That's on April 19th here in the council chambers. Uh, we ask that you talk to us ahead of time so we know you're coming and we can chat through things and um, let you know what your presentation should look like if that's the route you want to go. If you attend that local board and you still don't like what you heard, you can appeal at the county level. And that'll be June 12th this year at Hennepin County Government Center. Uh, and that's the final route of this more informal version of appeal. And then you can always attend tax court. Uh, there's a filing fee involved in that. You don't need to attend any of these board meetings to go there. Uh, you have up until April 30th of the year the taxes are due to file for that. So that would be 2023 assessment would be April 30th, 2024. 
So I'm going to dive into the statistics now. I, I felt it was important to kind of get that up front and, and really have people understand what we do and what goes into this, and it's not just hitting a button, bump everything 5%. So um, off to the left, you'll see our property type aggregations. Um, and then you'll see the parcel count next to it, and then the red box is 22 values and percent change, 23 value percent change, and then the percent change between years. And so that's what I'll focus on here is residential, you'll note 1.9% year over year. Uh, that's a big departure from last year that was sitting around 16%. And uh, we'll go into interest rates and volume after this, but, but that's a big piece of why things didn't go down and they're still kind of afloat. If you, if you jump down to condominiums and townhomes, uh, you'll notice those went up 4.9 and 4.1, respectively. And that kind of signals, hey, we have a little bit of affordability issue here. The stuff at the low end and the cheap end is the stuff that's getting multiple offers still and, and increasing at a higher rate. Um, as far as commercial goes, that, that went up 3.5%. And that's a mixed bag of properties. Some did well, some did not do well. Um, industrial, you'll note 20.7%, and it's still a hot market. It has not been impacted by uh, interest rates, and it's it's strictly e-commerce is growing. People expect same-day, next-day delivery, and, and people need warehouses. Uh, apartments, this is a departure from the last 10 years. We actually went down 1% on our apartment values this year. It's gone up the last 9 out of 10, and this is the one where it did not, and, and I'll get more into that later. And here's just a 10-year look at historical values. Blue is residential, uh, orange-ish is commercial industrial, and red is apartment. The things to note on this slide is 2014 versus 2023. We've gained $7 billion in value in the city. Uh, we're sitting at $17.6 billion in value now, so you know, quite 40% increase in value, um, or rather... Not, that's the wrong math, but <laughs> you get what an 80% increase in value. And then you'll look at your apartments and $795 million in value in 2014, up to the $2.225 billion this year. So that's nearly tripled in value, and, and much of that is a function of the new, uh, new properties coming online, but, but there's been some serious appreciation over the past two or three years as well up until this year. And commercial, um, not, not as much growth as the other two segments, but not as much development in that uh, segment. Residential statistics, I know this is something everyone's interested in, is uh, off to the left, assessment year, median value is the, the third column past that. Uh, last year was 355,900. We're sitting at 361,800, so that 1.7% change. Last year's median went up 16%. So uh, I included at the bottom 2007, that was our previous peak, and that was 247,900, and it stayed there through the market crashes up until 20, 2018 is when we exceeded that peak in 20, 2007. So uh, quite a bit of time passed just to get back to where we were. But then from 2018 up to 2023, we've increased 40% on our median value home. So um, things, things move quickly, and uh, I'll show you on, on a slide following, but there's not a lot of cheap stuff out there anymore. Um, and then off to the right, this is condos, townhomes, co-ops. The, the thing to point out here is we've got about $1.5 billion in value in these three property types of our 10.2 total residential value. So about 15% of our residential value is made up of condos, townhomes, or co-ops. Here's the historical interest rate slide I was referencing. Uh, it doesn't pinpoint it on here, but I can tell you the number. January of 22 was 3.22% average for a 30-year fixed. January of 23 was a 6.48, so just slightly above double in one year. Uh, you know, this looks pretty drastic here, but if you panned this out another 10, 15 years, you know, this 6.4 that we're sitting at currently, that, that's pretty average. It, it fits the trend curve pretty well. Um, but it, it is a shock to the system here, bouncing up so high so fast. So that ties directly into our... Um, Volume statistics here. This is provided by MAR, so Minneapolis area realtors. Um, you'll note that the important thing for me is January versus January, since those are our assessment dates, so that's what I pulled here. Change in new listings down 37.9% in Bloomington. Change in closed sales down 29.6%. Now, the important thing to, to note here is you saw we went up 2% in value about on the single-family residential. Uh, you saw interest rates double. The math doesn't quite check out between those two statistics, and this is why. Um, people are locked in sub-3% mortgages. They're not willing to sell their house. 
and take a 6% mortgage. And typically when we have a housing crash or housing bubble, it's, it's tied directly to high unemployment levels where we have very low unemployment levels. So no one is selling their house unless they have to. If you're moving up from a first time home buyer to something slightly larger, you're not gonna wanna double your mortgage payment to get an extra bedroom in your house. So, so that's where we're seeing the, the crunch here and I'm not sure where it goes from here. We'll, we'll keep an eye and, and figure out what the data says, but um, you know, most analysts thought we'd be down five, 10% in value at this point because the interest rates doubled and, and that's just not the case. So here's one of our stratifications and this is market value. Um, so you look to the left and these are groupings of homes, single family detached homes in those stratifications. And then you look to the right and that's the value change. Uh, the parcel count is the second column and you'll note the 100, 100 to 200 K total we have 86 homes left in the city, detached single family homes. You'll also note the change in value from 22 to 23 in the far right column, 12 and percent for the cheapest stuff, 8.5 for the second cheapest level. And then it drops off dramatically where everything else is going up one to 2% till you get to the million dollar plus range, which is up 4.4%. So those less impacted by um, interest rates are those still transacting with multiple offers and so on and still achieving the, the prices they want. And then a quick slide about apartments. As I mentioned, nine out of 10 last years, increase, increase, increase. We're down 1% this year. And that's even after the new construction added. Um, off to the right, apartment housing stock breakdown. The, the interesting part about this chart is we've got 8.3% of our total stock that was built between 2020 and 2022. And then if you look to that little red sliver, little orange sliver, we only added 5.7% in two decades from 1990 to 2009. So construction's picking back up. We'll see where it goes from here. I know there's stuff in the pipeline. I can't speak to if developers are still moving forward with the new lending uh, environment, but um, you know, up to this point, we had been adding quite a bit of stock. Commercial industrial, this just breaks it out into further segments here. So. Um, 2022 value, 2023 is the next column. Gross change and net change, there's, there's an important distinction to make here. Our net change is subtracting the new construction. And this is how we typically talk about change because uh, if you look at automotive services at the top there, it says gross change 14.9, but after you chop out the new buildings that were constructed, it's 6.8. So really the existing buildings went up 6.8%, not 14.9. So I'll be talking a net change on this slide. Um, the hospitality industry up 8.1. We're, we're getting close to occupancy levels and revenue that we had back in 2019. We're not there yet. I think we're, we're probably around 95% or so. I can, I can find those actual numbers, but it's, it's close. Uh, industrial up that 17.9 after net construction. And then um, if you look down office buildings, we're at 1% increase and in pretty much all of the class A nice high-end office we left flat and, and it's because companies are figuring out what right size looks like, what downsize looks like. People are leaving buildings, not signing. Uh, there's kind of this flight for quality where people are, are leaving downtown and, and other buildings to find high amenity buildings. So um, things are still shaking out there. Some of the smaller, older office buildings have transacted for higher numbers, but the, the newer stuff is, is pretty stagnant. And then retails at the bottom there, that was up 1.5%. So we're seeing a little bounce there, but, but not much. And then down at the bottom, that's just a 10 year look of commercial industrial value. And you'll see a dip there, 2021, 2022 for COVID. And note that we're, we're back well above 2019 and 2020 here in 2023. So then I just wanted to talk to property tax briefly here um, and just recall our assessment date, right? One, two, 23. And the preliminary levy is set September of 23. Uh, truth in taxation meetings in November of 23. Final levy is set and certified December of 23. Then your taxes are payable May and October of 24. And I think it's important to put this on a slide here and just show that our assessment is set about 12 months before the levy is, is certified. We just want, want to reiterate, we get this call many, many times a year that we don't set the assessment to increase the taxes collected. These are two separate processes, they're, they're not the same. So I just wanted to clarify, we set our assessment, then the levy is set to determine how much tax is needed to be collected. And I'll go through an example here 
um, to show that you know increase in value doesn't necessarily mean increase in taxes. So this is our median sale this year uh, down at the bottom here. It's a 1954 built Rambler um, and it, it's homestead. So just to note what, what the homestead exclusion, I have a few bullets at the top there, but basically it's progressive in nature. The higher you value your home, the less of exclusion you get. Once you hit 413,800 in value, you no longer get an exclusion. Now you still wanna be homestead. You still need to be homestead to qualify for a property tax refund and some other programs. So it's still important, but um, just note that it does disappear. Um, so down in our example below, we've got the year, the assessment and the taxes payable year. So they're one year after each other. And then you have your EMV, which is our market value we set. And then the taxable market value is, is what the value is after the homestead exclusion. So then following that, we have the percent change year over year there for this property. And then you'll see the taxes off to the right. So, so to note this, um, 21 with taxes payable 22, the value went up 7.47, the taxes actually went up 8.21. So there are years where your taxes do go up more than the value does. Then you look at 22, where the value went up 4% and taxes went down almost 5%. And you'll recall the median home went up 16%, so this home didn't go up nearly as much as its neighbors, so the taxes actually went down that year even though the value was appreciating. So, so it summarizes in that right little panel there. Change in value over these five years was 37.6%. Change in taxes was 20.6%. So I just wanted to reiterate, change in value does not necessitate the equivalent change in taxes. I think that's a very important to, distinction to make. Um, there's some years like this property where your taxes are going to go down even though the levy went up. And my final slide here, I just wanted to briefly talk about refunds and programs. I think this is very important, and there's a lot of money left on the table here. Um, you know, there's, there's three property tax refunds. There's for renters, and there's the regular, and there's the special. Um, the regular and the special are required that your homestead, one has an income restriction, one does not. It kind of summarizes in that chart down below. And um, the big takeaway here is a, a lot of people don't apply because they don't think they qualify or they don't know to apply and no one tells them. If you have a tax preparer, you can ask them. You can ask us, you can ask the Department of Revenue, but um, Hennepin shared their data from 2019. I don't have anything newer, but in 2019, they estimated $60 million of property tax refund were left on the table. And that's of people that were homestead. So that doesn't count for anyone who didn't homestead and apply. Um, with the maximum refund of 3140 assuming they were all regular refund and all would have got the max, that would have been at least 20,000 households that didn't get a refund they should have. It's more likely closer to 30,000 people that, that just didn't get a refund because they didn't apply. So I think it's really important to ask your tax preparer or, or go on the MDOR website and take a look um, and just look at the programs available. I also wanted to highlight the senior deferral. And just to clarify, this is a deferral, this is a loan, this is not a refund. But what it does is it limits the amount of taxes you pay at 3% of your income. It is income and age restricted, um, but the remainder is paid by the state as a loan. And that loan is a variable rate loan, but it will never exceed 5% interest. So it's still a good deal if, if you're having trouble making those tax payments to get a 5% loan to pay what you can't pay. Um, you do have to repay the loan at the time of sale or time of exit of the program. But it is available. All of this information is on the Minnesota Department of Revenue website. You can call them, you can call us to discuss. Uh, happy to talk through it with you. And most definitely, if you do have someone prepare your taxes, bring up the property tax refund with them. So that is my presentation for this evening. Any questions for me? Thank you, Mr. Bulger. That was, as always, it was, I, I, it's, a, it's a full presentation. Every year when we hear the assessment reports, it's a full, in, full of information. And it's always good to hear. It's just interesting and I think good to base a lot of what we do, a lot of what we think of, a lot of what we talk about based on what we just heard over the last half hour here. Council, any questions of Mr. Bulger? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Mr. Bulger, thank you for this. Um, I'm, I'm curious um, uh, if um, you uh, have any uh, particular insights for us as it relates to the conversations you had with folks as they came through? Um, anything that you can uh, offer us in terms of, I mean, I, I'm making some assessment assumptions based on some of the data that you shared, but it, but it would be helpful if, if for example, um, there were any you know, comments made or any particular 
items that would give us insights on something you know to work on for example um you know are there a lot of people who are saying they're deferring um work on their houses because of you know things so that should we for example you know, uh, provide a little bit more information on our home improvement options that they have and other things like this. Anything that you might want to flag for us? Sure. Mr. Thank Mayor, you. Council Member D'Alessandro. Um, I would say that, that most of the conversations we have, um, there's, there's some sort of level of confusion of the process or, you know, I'm assessed this year, taxes next year, timeline issues. Um, anecdotally, we have been hearing some people more so than the normal talk about how they're being taxed out of their home or if if it's worth this much uh, I'll give you the keys if you cut me a check kind of deal <laughs> but yeah we, we have been hearing people struggling and and um, it's challenging with with the way the market is and values and you know if you if you were priced out and wanted to downsize your home uh, that's definitely not an option in this interest rate environment you might be paying the same amount for a half the size home at this point so yep. yeah every year um, you know, we hammer the, the property tax refund. We say, you know, look into this. A lot of people don't know it's a thing, uh, and a lot of people don't have a tax preparer, so no one informs them, or they go through some some quick company or online company, and then they never hear about the M1PR form they need to fill out. Thanks. But I think um, on a permit level, we watch that, and we track that to see, you know, are building permits down, are people less less inclined to repair their residential homes, so we can put that together after a few more months of data. Yeah, thanks, appreciate it. Thanks. Council Member Loman. Thank you, Mayor, just a real quick question. On the historical values by property type, uh, the condos fall uh, in into the apartment or is that in the residential? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Loman, uh, we would consider that residential. So what, while it's apartments technically are classified residential, they're, they're class 4A, they're, they're, we still bucket them separately. Um, but condos are the same as townhomes and single-family detached. Thank you. Yeah. Councilmember Mua. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, can you just explain to me what a co-op is? Because I just I don't know what it is. <sighs> Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Mua, I I wish I could. No, I'm kidding. It's it's a very complex um, system essentially, and and they have. Limited equity, full equity, but essentially you you buy your way into a co-op. You don't own the real estate, but there's a very large purchase price. And then you also pay a monthly fee that's sort of like rent. Um, so it's they're all structured slightly differently. We have a handful of them here. We have Applewood Points. We have Friendship Villages is some sort of co-op. Uh, it, it doesn't meet the standards of a normal co-op, but it's, it's kind of structured similarly where you, you kind of get – get uh, the right to move along in Friendship Village, for instance, you get the right to move along to different levels of care by buying into it. Um, you don't necessarily have the real estate. So you don't you don't own the real estate, you own a share in the building. So kind of piggybacking on the last two questions, uh, looking at the slide here, the assessment summary statistics that you have here, showing with residential at 48% of the total which would then put, you know, commercial and industrial, commercial industrial, the apartments, the condos, everything else at about 52 percent. Uh, we have had this conversation in the past here that this 50-50 split is not common for a for a, for a suburb, an, an, an urban center. You know, outside of the urban core, this is not common for a, a first or second ring suburb to have only only 48 percent of the residential. Assessment statistics go to uh, go to residential, and so this this fifty fifty split has been unique to Bloomington for a number of years, and we always call it out, and it's always interesting to me just because it it does make us stand out from just about everybody else in the state of Minnesota. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I would agree. Um, we we have very high value commercial properties. We have forty five hotels in the city. We have the Mall of America. We have uh, quite a few Class A office towers that, that don't exist. We have a lot of tall buildings here that most most suburbs don't have. I, outside of Bloomington, there's there's only a handful of Class A office towers that, that are outside of the downtown area. And we have, I think, what, 12, 13, something like that. I'd have to get the actual number for you, but it's, it's significant. So uh, a lot of our commercial value comes from the hospitality and the office. 
Yeah, I just, um, as I said, I always think that's it's interesting to see that, and it, it's been consistent. Maybe a couple points here and there, but it's been pretty consistent over the years. And and just to piggyback that on, on that, um, if you'll lo note on this slide, the residential went from 48.7 of our total down to 48 percent. So that would indicate a slight shift in property taxes off of the, the residential property and onto the industrial and commercial property. So uh, that's that's a silver lining here for for many people yes. rather than, yes. than few people. Else, any additional questions? All right, this was an information item. We have no action on it, but thank you very much, Mr. Bulger. Well done, thank you very much. Thank you. Our second organizational business item this evening is uh, an update and discussion on our budget. And Kari Carlson is gonna update. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So for tonight, I have some preliminary 2022 year-end financial information to share with you. Some highlights from the 2023 budget book, overall themes from your feedback on last year's budget process, this year's public engagement plan around the budget, and finally key dates in this year's budget calendar. So first off, I'll go through the preliminary 2022 financial results for the general fund. And I'm just gonna start by this here is the original 2022 budget for the general fund. So this would have both revenues and expenses that were approved, approved by the council back in December 2021 at 85.3 million. And then here are two pie charts. Again, this is 2022. Um, just showing the breakout of those revenues and expenses for the general fund. So on the left is the revenue chart, and 68% of the general fund revenues are comprised of property taxes. 9% comes from lodging and admission taxes, 7% permit and license revenue, and the remaining sources of revenue include transfers from other funds, grants, and program income. On the right, is the expense chart with a breakout of expenses by department and more than half of general fund expenses are comprised of police, fire, and public works. The remaining expenses are community development, community services, which includes uh, community outreach and engagement and public health, parks and recreation, finance, legal, and administration. So this next slide, so throughout 2022, um, budget adjustment resolutions were brought to council for approval for items such as carryover of unspent budget from the previous year, rollover of budget that was encumbered from purchase orders that weren't spent in the previous year, as well as budget adjustments to increase um, both revenue and expenses for grants that the city received or donations. And so the net result of the 2022 preliminary amended general fund budget was um, actually a planned spend down of available fund balance in the general fund by 3.3 million. This is the actual, um, or I should say preliminary actual 2022 year end general fund financial results. So we'll have our final results after our audit. This is preliminary. But as you can see, um, this is what was reported to the council at the end of February. Um, for 2022, they're far more favorable than um, there's, as we're showing that the revenues um, are higher than the expenses by 2.6 million for the end of 2022. So this positive budget variance is due to lodging tax revenue, admission tax revenue, and permit revenue all being much higher than budgeted for 2022, as well as expenses being uh, lower than budgeted. So um, moving to the 2023 budget. So on December 5th, 2022, the city council approved the 2023 property tax levy of 74.5 million which was an increase of 9.15% over the 2022 property tax levy. And um, as you know, the 23 budget focused on the city's um, strategic plan, Bloomington Tomorrow Together, 
by investing in city priorities to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. And as you recall, a major theme from the 23 budget was that it was a significant investment in public safety. 85% of that tax levy increase was an investment in police and fire services. And the 23 budget added three full-time firefighters in addition to the 18 full-time firefighters that were, were recently added uh, this week with the SAFER grant to address critical staffing issues and begin the transformation in the fire department from a mainly paid on call part-time department to a hybrid model of full-time and part-time firefighters. And then also in the 23 budget, four police officers were added um, to help decrease the amount of overtime officers are expected to work to meet basic staffing needs. And there was also an uh, addition, a new position added in dispatch. This slide is our city property tax dollar, just to illustrate that um, on this uh, representation that on one tax dollar that for the entire city, 50 cents of that dollar are going to police and fire, 25 cents are going to public works, 16 cents are going to community development, community services, parks and recreation, and then nine cents are going to debt service payments for capital projects like road infrastructure projects and facility improvements. So the annual, the 2023 budget book was published on the city's website on March 1st. Um, it was submitted to the Government Finance Officers Association for consideration of their Distinguished Budget Presentation Award that the city has uh, received for 27 years. And um, there's easy access to this document on the city's website. If you go to the city's website, the main page, and click on City Budget and scroll down to the bottom, um, you can see this um, online document. And uh, we do still print a small number of hard copy budget books, and I distributed them to the council um, this evening. They were just printed this morning, just so you have easy reference um, for them. And just some key pages I'd like to point out in the budget book, both online or with your copies right there. Um, th there's the city manager's bu budget message, which is on page 21. There's uh, fund descriptions and structure on page 41. The budget process is explained on page 51. The calendar is on page 55. On page 119, I get this question a lot of um, the overall budget summary for the entire city. So all 30 funds put together, that's on page 119 as a summary. Um, there's also a lot, a lot of times questions on uh, full-time staffing, and that's on page 150. And then after that, we have a very detailed um, but each department submits information um, up that supports their budget requests, and that starts around page 152. So I just want to take a moment to highlight that. And then, um, as I said, part of the budget book has the city manager's budget message, and that is on pages 21 to 33. And it, it just um, it gives great examples of how the city's annual budget brings together the city council priorities, um, and the community priorities and needs and financial planning. Um, so just next, uh, we had asked the council for their feedback. Um, we met with them to um, just find out what the council thinks we're currently doing well with the budget process, what changes you'd like to see, um, maybe ideas for engaging the community. And these next couple slides I have here are just common themes that we heard from the council that we wanted to share um, that we're exploring to incorporate into this year's budget process or maybe next year's budget process. So I'm just going to read through these um, quickly. So um, some of the comments we had in the discussions were that you appreciated the transparency, the level of community engagement that we've added, uh, meeting people where they're at to engage residents. Um, to continue to work on making the city's finances and budget process straightforward and um, simple for the public to understand. That uh, we did an excellent job this last year of explaining what was causing the increase in property taxes. Um, just to keep in mind that the numbers alone can be intimidating and hard to understand, so the corresponding uh, narrative for the budget is important. That it's important to communicate about the investment specifically that's being made in the community. Um, one of the comments was considering a paid intern for additional public engagement in budget, but we have some other ideas about that 
oh, that would be nice to have some help. But I have that other idea. Um, consider partnering with schools, community groups, faith community for budget engagement, um, maybe a workshop at Creekside for property tax refunds, like the city assessor Tim Bolger was just talking about the senior deferral uh, program that's available. Um, there's comments that the department presentations that we did were pretty in-depth last year that the department heads did, and that those were uh, very well done and informative. Then we should continue to educate people on how their property values affect their tax levy and the timing of when they can appeal their values with assessing, and that the resources on the city's budget website, the videos and detailed information are very helpful. Um, just last month, um, Tim, Tim and I did a video that we put on the city's website just explaining those property tax valuation statements that came out last um, last month as well as the, the property tax statements. Um, could we designate amount, an amount of money for a one-time project that the public could weigh in on, a, like a resident-driven investment? So that's something we'll explore and bring to you if that's something that we'd want to include in the tax levy or in the budget for 2024. Um, and then we'd, we'd like to see some more department heads, maybe council members at budget tables in the community, which uh, that last comment leads into my next slide. Um, so we've increased, this is hard to read on here, but um, just to show you, we've increased the number of events, uh, budget tables that we're going to have this year. Um, and we've spread them out to different locations in the city, different times of the week, different days. Um, there's going to be um, budget tables at some department open houses, at some events for kids, at concerts, at farmer's market. And so this year I created a sign-up list for council members and department heads to join me at these public pu budget public engagement tables. And um, I recently sent out a sign-up list for city council members, and I'll send that out again um, tomorrow, and also to department heads. So um, if there are any events when you are available to join me, it would be wonderful for you to um, be there and, and be able to talk to residents and have a chance to um, engage about the budget and spending priority priorities, um, not only with me, but also with the council members and department heads, I think would be wonderful. And then finally, um, we, here, we could, all, we could oh. also make assignments to that too, and just... <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I know who's getting the Brodini magic show. <laughs> I, I literally just sent you an email saying I'm in for the magic oh, show. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Martin. Um, so this is the, the, the budget calendar. Um, so the kick, I'll, I, I'll, I won't go over every date, but what I'll highlight is we're starting off May 18th. It's a little earlier than normal with the budget kickoff for departments to enter their requests. And then other, di other dates I'll highlight is August 21st and November 20th. Those are the special city council budget meetings. And then uh, the 11th of September is preliminary 2024 tax levy. That's when that's set. And then December 4th is uh, when the final 2024 tax levy will be set. So that is all I have for this evening. Any questions? Well, thank you for this. It's a good good way to start, a good, to, to have the printed copies. I'm a printed copy kind of guy, so I appreciate that. And I uh, appreciate the information and the, uh, the willingness to take the feedback, as you did with all the council members. I think we all had an opportunity to, to talk with you about what we liked from last year and what we were hoping to accomplish this year. And so I appreciate that because uh, I think the... The consensus was, or at least my thought, I thought the budget process last year was as good and as robust as we've seen in my years on the council. And um, looking forward to seeing where you're going to take it again this year because it's uh, it's very informative, it's very helpful. I think it it provides great information, and I think it uh, it it's fantastic. I mean, it really is. It's it, very well done. Council, any questions or comments for Ms. Carlson? Councilmember Loman, but I'm sorry, the, the Brodini magic show was taken. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would be disappearing at that magic show. Um, I, you know, uh, Mayor, I, I would say I also agree with uh, your statements. I mean, uh, this has come a long ways uh, from when I first uh, got here on council. I mean, those those meetings were brutal. <laughs> we went through uh, budget, um, and I think that's the the most appropriate way to say. I just, I, I you know, hey, it's going to be great to see what this looks like uh, uh, and what we continue to do uh, kind of moving forward. So uh, thank you for your hard work and uh, uh, Lori's uh, work as well and the rest of your team. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
So I did have one question. I think um, just to clarify, so when you, you, you showed the 2022 pie chart of expenditures, and I think that showed the, the total public safety was it was like 42% for public safety for police and fire. And then when you showed the, the dollar, the 2023 city property tax dollar, it was at 50%. Is there really that 8% increase based on the uh, expenditures we're making in public safety? Um, Mayor, um, city council members, those are two different looks at the budget. So the one with the pie charts is only the general fund. Ah, okay. and, all, and that includes revenues that are not property taxes. And then when we're just looking at the property tax dollar, that's just taking the property taxes and splitting that Got over it. all the funds. So sorry to be confusing. That's okay. I'm easily confused sometimes. But uh, that's uh, even, you know, regard, regardless, cut, you know, split it in half. If it's somewhere between 42 and 50% of our, our, our tax dollars are going toward public safety, I think that says... A, uh, a lot about our, our commitment to that here in Bloomington. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I think the way I always say it is if 60 68% of our revenue is from property tax, every dollar in that 68% is cut this way. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so um, one, of the, one of the things that I think um, gets lost in the shuffle around budget is um, the – um, how do I say this, the cost of doing business. So in other words, if we did nothing else, like traditionally speaking, most people get cost of living increases in their salaries, for example, of 3%. I don't know if that number is like even valid anymore in the world. But um, when we talk about what the, um, what the, uh, the budget goes to, I think um, one of the things that um, – is helpful for people to understand is where it is, uh, where, where, what part of the increase. So, so for example, when we did our 9% levy, um, if we, if we had taken out a cost of living adjustments or cost of doing business adjustments of three or three and a half percent, we really only invested 6% of that property tax dollar in new things, of which then 80% of it or 85% of it was police and fire, if you will. I don't know if that's a way, there's a way for us to get to that number. Um, but I think a lot of these numbers change year over year, largely due to variability and costs of goods that we need to purchase in, you know, the amount of, of um, uh, you know, tax we pay on things or the shift in um, um, inventory, supply, demand inventories, and things of that nature. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's something we track at a granular level. It may be something that we could do at a high level, but I think what, that's one of those questions. I'd love to, to consider us finding out what people know about what those things are uh, for us. Um, like, What's the number? You know, what what would they guess it is, and versus what it actually is, and that would require us to do a little bit of, of insight. So I throw that out there just as another another cut at the data um, that we might be able to help people understand that when you know if we did nothing new and we only had to raise enough taxes to cover the expenses, would that still be three three and a half percent more than a year ago because of the cost of doing business, or would it be more, or would it be less? I think those things are interesting, and I think people can resonate. That can resonate with people um, because that happens in their own homes as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you, Council Member. Did you have your hand up, Mr. Berkeley? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I thought I saw you raise your hand. Anything else, Council? If not, I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Item 5.3 on our agenda is a discussion regarding a tree assessment ordinance and payment plans. And in my 12 years on the council, I can say this is the first time I've heard this as, a, uh, as, a, as an agenda topic. I don't remember talking about this in the past. Mayor and council, it is the first time. Very good. Ms. Economy Shoulder, good evening, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just uh, clicking through here. So just some background information um, on the slide. Um, in 2017, uh, 63 po properties in Bloomington received um, bills and payment plans and uh, assessments. Um, at that time, it was mainly Emerald Ashboard and, um, excuse me, 
Dutch Elm and um, Oak Wilt. Um, and as you can see, um, starting at about 2020 uh, on, the largest increase is because of MRL ash borer. So in 2022, it was 157 properties, over 150% increase. When we brought to the city council back in September, this change of the numbers, the change in amounts, um, the council had a brief discussion about is there something that we can change? Because currently in our ordinance, um, it's only a one-year assessment at an 8% interest rate. Um, and we did some research, and as, you will, as we go through that, um, we're able to expand that to match what's at the state is up to a 10-year um, portion. So again, number of trees and the total charges. In 2017, it was just under 60,000, and in 2022, 300,000. So average invoice, again, under 1,000 in 2017, and just under 2,000 in 2022. Again, you just see some of the same information. You can see just the number of total invoices over the years. You can see the total amount invoiced and the average, how it's increased over that period of time. And then we did some breakout of um, looking at just price um, points of where things were at. So in 2022, of that just under 300,000, of total um, cost, 65 of those properties were um, under $1,200, and then it broke out. Um, so we would move that around. So approximately 60% of the numbers were after that first cutoff. They were between $1,200 and $8,000. So again, Current ordinance um, is one year assessment. They would have to pay the entire amount in their next property tax bill at an 8% interest rate. We are looking at um, some payment plan options. Uh, four different ones currently are in the model that we'll walk you through at a 6.5% interest rate. So right now we're looking at a one year for if it's $1,200 or less, a one year assessment at 6.5%. If it's between um, 1,200 and 3,000, it is um, three years, 3,000 to 6,000, five years, and over 6,000 would be 10 years. And then we looked at a couple other comparison cities, and they have different interest rates. Um, Apple Valley has four different plans, um, and they're still charging the max under state statute that we can go as the 8%. Manitonka is a little bit less at 5.5%, and Adina is at the 6.5%, which is where we were at it at our interest rate. Um, and those were the, the different comparisons we have. And um, I think there was a question on if we can have more um, options, we could have them whatever variety the city council would like or where they would like the price point change. Um, so if we can make whatever adjustments because this is a discussion item and we would bring whatever um, the council would like differently um, back when we come back on May 1st with the ordinance change and a fee schedule change. And after that, it's just discussion. So I'll leave this one back up for questions. Thank you for this uh, council discussion. Before we dive into it, I'm just gonna say the, the increases are just staggering not just the, 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 the cost of tree removal is just absolutely unbelievable to see it go up 400% like that in five years. Yep. And, and part of the increase is that, <clears throat> uh, well, part of it is the emerald ash borer is not dying with our cold weather. We don't have enough of it for a long enough period of time for it to die. And even in Northern Minnesota, it's just not cold enough for long enough that it's wiping out a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. And then there's an abundance of trees being removed, so the price to dispose of them is increasing too. And I've got to imagine you knowing ash trees, are, they're big trees too, and they're, mm -hmm. they're, it's gotta take some work, so that, but that number is just stunning to me. Councilmember Lohman, and then I saw another hand up, Councilmember D'Alessandro, Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
So I don't know where, which study I read this at um, some time back that you know, the average American has something where in the neighborhood of $400 uh, for emergencies. Um, uh, and so I, I started asking the question as I looked at this, you know, if you kind of take 400, you multiply that by 10, uh, that's about 4,000. Um, I, I wonder if... Uh, for those who are, you know, we, we talk about, you know, equity and inclusion and that type of thing, uh, or, or those who are just challenged from a from an economic kind of standpoint, I wonder if it makes some sense to kind of, you know, kind of look at uh, how to uh, redo some of these these ladders, if they were, or options for uh, levy terms uh, that we we have in here. Um, so I just wonder with that. You know, that first one, is there a way to maybe does it make sense to you? I don't know what the impact is to the city, you know, by, by, by rolling this out or, or, or pushing it out uh, to 10 years uh, for, for more of these. But I'm just kind of uh, curious to see what other folks think um, about kind of changing some of those. Uh, for those of us uh, who, are, who are here who may be impacted, I know of a couple of people in my district who were impacted by that. And uh, uh, paying was a real problem. Um, so I, I just throw that out there. Mayor and Council, we would end up paying the vendor what the, the cost is um, on these assessments, and then it would just take time to repay the city. So it, um, that's where the interest rate comes back, is repaying the city mm -hmm. the price on that. Mm -hmm. It's how long to carry for it. Um, and currently, the residents that are paying these are paying these all in one year. So they seem to be managing some of this, but we can move the rates around. Um, if you want to go back just a couple more slides, just look at the average. So the average in 2017 was $948. The average now for each one is 1800 So majority of them would not even fall in that $1,200 range. They would fa fall above that um, even for a one tree. It's quite high. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, just thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I remember the conversation we had, it, you triggered in part by some resident requests and I know Councilmember Martin asked for some work on this specifically. So thank you, uh, this is great. Um, uh, a quick question, is the, is the room, is tree removal, these are for, so these 157 invoices are right-of-way trees for which the, the user, the resident was responsible? Is that how that works or is it, I mean, I can't call the city and ask for the tree in my backyard to be pulled down, right? It needs to be a right-of-way. Am I right about that? Um, Ms. Mandershan, I think, can clarify things for us. Uh, Mayor members, uh, state law provides some uh, uh, enabling authority for cities to prov to do these these types of special assessments. Uh, it's in 429.101. There's two different ones that apply to trees. Uh, the one is um, the trimming and care of trees and the removal of unsound trees from any street. And then the other one that we come across um, often is the treatment and removal of in, insect infested or diseased trees on private property. And there's more to it. But the Oftentimes, it's my understanding that these are diseased trees. Uh, obviously, we saw a large influx with emerald ash borer, but there are other uh, infestations that have moved through in the past. Okay, so it, it's a diseased tree can be anywhere on a private property, and if it's, but it has to be found by the city in order for it to be assessed. Then is that am I reading that correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay, so once again, I can't call up the city and go, "I think I have a diseased tree. Come look at it." Yeah. Oh, I could. You can. Okay. All right. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, um, so I, I think, um, I think a flattening this makes some sense to me. Um, uh, you know, four tiers versus three tiers. I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know like if that makes, it, I just makes it harder for everybody. I don't know. Um, could we go back to the slide where we have the tiers defined? That's great, thanks. Nope. That, well, yeah, either way is fine. Very good. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm wondering if it if it makes sense to say um, this 
it maybe is a silly way to do this, but if it's under 3,000, they can pick one or three year terms. If it's over 3,000, they can pick five or 10 year terms. I don't know if something like that, just to make it nice and smooth. I don't know if that's, you know, um, gets where um, Council Member Lohman is thinking about it here, which is, you know, making it possible for that, like, you know, in that $3,000 bucket, if that is something that we can have for certain individuals spread out over a longer period of time. But, um, you know, I don't, to me, the, the fact is, as you mentioned, the average is going to be under that 3000 for the vast majority of folks that are going to take advantage of this. Um, the other thing I think we talked about, um, and I don't know if this is something that is to be thrown in here is I'd love to see, um, some kind of incentive for replacing the trees. So if if you um, I know we have a fifty dollar like tree um, purchase option or something to that effect, but if we thought about hey if you commit to planting a tree and replacement for this, we'll waive that fifty dollars and bring you a tree or something like that, just to incentivize um, that we replace these trees as quickly as we possibly can. Um, I don't. I realize that that's not the specific discussion, but if we're going to roll out a program, I'd like it to be comprehensive in terms of its education to the public. Um, so, yeah, I'm all. I'm, I mean, I think this is great. I appreciate the reduction in the interest rate. I appreciate the tiering structure. I think that will help people. I'm, I guess, kind of ambivalent on how many we have, but that stratification seemed to make sense to me. One to three years, if you're under, maybe it's five under five over five or under two over two and then who cares how high it goes because it seems like the average is about 1800 right now so that gives us room to move over the next five years as it probably goes up to 2500 or something like that in the next five years actually your comments council member brought up a question yeah uh, when you talk about replacement uh, Ms. economy Scholler, when we're talking about the prices that you mentioned earlier does that include stump removal or is that just cutting the tree down Mayor and Council, I'm not aware of the difference in the price. Mr. Ruggie? Mr. Mayor and Council members, we do have our public works director on the meeting, so we could probably bring in Carl to answer that question. My understanding is it is typically just the tree removal. The stumping is uh, is uh, an additional cost. And the stumping can be a significant additional cost. It can, cost. yeah. Hmm. And Mr. Keel's available as well. Mr. Keel, are you with us? Carl, you're there. Your name is there. <laughs> well, we might be having some. I'm sorry, Mayor. That was a little technical difficulty there getting getting on. Uh, but yes, uh, on the, the question of does that include stump removal? Yes, it does. Oh, it does. Um, and the project also. Uh, just to clarify, these are for private trees, so these are all on private property under the responsibility of the homeowner. Uh, Right-of-way trees that are removed are done at city cost. Okay. So those those average costs that we saw that we were commenting on, the, the how high they were, but they do include not only taking the tree down, but removing the stump as well. Yes. Good. Typically, yes. Good. That, that probably helps to explain the high cost, but it, it's still a pretty darn high cost. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Keel, do you have anything to add to the discussion here this evening uh, as you've been listening and, and watching? No, nothing more to add. I think good questions. Very good. Any questions of Mr. Keel while we have him? Uh, Councilmember Nelson? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Keel. Uh, just to clarify, right away versus private property, the front easement over the yard is private property, correct? That would, that would not be covered by the city. Uh, no, the the front portion adjacent to the street, roughly 15 feet, the easement is considered right of way. So that's a city cost. So these would be street uh, trees that are beyond that 15, roughly 15 foot behind the curb mark. Okay, thank you for that clarification because I think that impacts a lot of people with those trees close to there. Um, I don't know if I have any other questions for Mr. Keel. I do have other questions, but. We can we can be as flexible as possible here, Councilmember Nelson. Go ahead. Any other questions? Um, how uh, can you remind me of what our assessment policy is for uh, street improvements? Because um, I believe we have a similar program where you can either pay it 
or you can pay, make payments at an interest rate. What is the interest rate on those, and what are the terms of those? And the reason I ask is just consistency, ease for our accounting team, and ease for our residents to understand it. Obviously, the costs are slightly different on those, uh, which I think, think gets to Councilmember D'Alessandro's point that you know some of the larger expenses may make sense to tie out over the long period. But uh, what are those like? So Mayor um, and Council Member Nelson, so for road improvements, um, when a letter goes out in September to the residents, which is the final cost of what the road reconstruction portion is for the resident, um, then they could start making their, um, I would call it a pending assessment amount. They can make payment amounts in September, October, right before the end of November, they can make three payments to pay it off um, during that. And wherever we're at with that amount um, for that road reconstruction at the end of November, what's left there can go off to assessment for 10 years. Um, the trees currently, we're um, doing a lot of payment plans on them um, so that they can make payment plans and make payments each month during the, the period. So it will depend on the timing of when the tree comes down when we invoice them. Um, so if the tree came down in February, we inv invoice them in March, they can make payments from March all the way through November and pay that down. Or they don't have to pay anything until um, that period of time. So on July 1st, they would get a letter telling them like we do with civil fines and um, um, delinquent utility bills and those type. They get a letter and we would tell them up front in February when the tree came down what's coming and have it all laid up for them. Okay, so it seems like fairly different processes. One goes through assessing, one is managed by the city, the counter Okay, thank you. Um, and then do people have the right to just hire their own company to take these trees down? Okay, so if they wanted to get multiple bids and all that, they could. Yes, they uh, can. Um, they could potentially take it down themselves if they were so equipped but no <laughs> they do okay i don't have those skills so i don't know so i could if it was about four feet or less i could probably take it down myself but uh so um and then uh, the final question i had was um are there any potential uh prepayment penalties so if somebody selected a five-year option could they just pay extra and not continue to accrue the interest and things like that and pay it off in two years, three years, whatever their cash flow allowed? So just to clarify, when we would set up um, these payment mounts um, and staff turnover um, to, to allow a customer to keep figuring out how they want to do it versus the dollar amount, I mean, I, I'd like to know more about how the council wants to do an option. And so if a um, customer wants this, this, and this versus, okay, the dollar amount falls here, so we know we do this, and we're consistent of how we do that. Um, staff turnover could um, make the, really go crazy. Um, you know, if we're basing this off a certain three-year period, a five-year period, a 10-year period, or, you know, if you don't even want any one year, we can get rid of a one year and just move it all down to two, three, five, and 10. Okay. But to give customers options. But once it's assessed, just like any other assessment, they can prepay, you know, say it's two years in, they can prepay it plus that year of interest and it's gone. No penalty. They do have to pay the interest for that year like any other assessment at this county. Okay. So you'd like to have stability in the, in if they were gonna not do the one-time payment, you'd like to have stability in the cost. And that, and that I think from my perspective, uh, it makes sense. I mean, the reality is the city is not a bank. It doesn't manage loans. These aren't loans. We don't have all these different terms. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if you wanted to, you could simply go get a personal loan to cover the cost of it. And then you would be able to deal with the bank and prepay it or whatever you wanted to do. So I just wanted to just understand that if it, it sounds like it's easiest for staff, makes the most sense, it's probably the most fiscally prudent in my mind for the, for the city to not have to manage all these different variables like you either set it up at this much per month or you set it up at that much per month and then it's done. 
Okay, and thank then, you. And thank then, you. Mayor and Council, just to make a comment, this fee structure would be in our Appendix A, and as we see the fees changing or the rates of costs increasing on um, the changes, we would bring it back to Council to update the fee schedule too. Ms. Mandershan, anything to add to that? No, thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Nelson, you're, you're clear on that now? We're good? Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor, uh, and, and thank you for, for bringing this back. I know I've heard from a couple of residents, especially seniors on fixed incomes, the tree comes down and they say, what do I do now? So this is really heartening to see. I appreciate it. Um, in general, okay, just to make sure I, I heard correctly, so if somebody decides they want to go, say, with the, the three-year plan, their finance is stabilized, they're in a better spot a year in, they could pay off the remainder of that in the interest and be fine? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, and just, I guess, for, for preference's sake, I'm comfortable with what you have presented here. Um, but considering, I'm not sure who would be in having an acute financial shortfall, I, I would assume they would be looking for at least two years to kind of stabilize or stretch that out as opposed to the one-year option. So if we're looking to simplify, um, to your earlier point, I could see dropping that, but otherwise... I support what's here. And I will say I have really no uh, tree cutting skills either in particular, <laughs> but it has not stopped me. So give me a call. <laughs> Councilmember Nelson. <laughs> Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just as a follow-up on that, I think um, I think if I understood the original comment, if I, if I have an assessed tree taken down in March and you assess it to me, um, I have until the November bill essentially to pay that off without any interest whatsoever. Am that I correct? That is correct. Okay. So, so that could be almost, uh, I mean, that's six months, seven months without interest if I chose to pay it. And I can pay that in payments if I wanted to, I assume, mm -hmm. uh, or I can pay it all in November. Okay. So then um, at that point, we're talking about another year on top of that, um, so I'm wondering if if it if it is, it would essentially be almost three years. I think then if we if if that first six or seven months is interest free, followed by a year's worth of interest at six and six and a half percent. Um, yeah, I I don't. Um, I think making it as simple as possible makes sense to me. And um, if if it's if there's three options, I'm, I think that's just easier. One, three, and something else. I don't know if 10 is enough. I mean, I don't, to me, 10 seems like a long time for something that is averaging $1,800 right now. So maybe it's, you know, two, three, five as our choices or something to that effect. Um, I don't know. I'm 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 for three. I think if if you're asking for discussion names, I think three's fine. I think go, you know anything above like three thousand, make it five years. And if if we get to a point where we are charging people six thousand dollars for tree removal, there's a whole other conversation about why we're all not in the tree removal business. <laughs> if that's the case, um, so I think that's that's the last I, I think I have to say on it. I just want to make sure I had, was clear on the timetable. And it sounds like for most people, even after they receive the bill, they have several months interest-free to try to make payments on it if they want to at this yep. stage. Um, Mayor, Council Member um, D'Alessandro, um, it could be more than one tree. They could have three, four, five, six trees in their backyard that come down all at the, the two, you know. So um, it might not be that hard to reach six grand. Mm. And above. Um, would you mind pulling the slide back again that shows the the tree distribution? Yeah, thanks. This is just one invoice, so it could be um, so that there was three invoices in the neighborhood of um, seven to eight thousand dollars, and one invoice over eight thousand. So those would be multiple trees. Mm hmm Okay, fair enough. I, don't, I, don't, I still feel I, like I, over five five years or something. And I and I do want to weigh in on Councilmember Dallas. I know just to be clear, you, you've. 
you've used language a couple of times, and I want to make sure you understand the process here. I think what uh, Ms. Manderscheid told us, if, if somebody has a diseased tree in the backyard and their city tree inspectors see it, mm -hmm. they basically go and they, they tag it and they say, remove your tree. Yep. And then the homeowner has the opportunity. They can either contract individually, and if they're not able to do it, then the city steps in. So, right. I mean, it's... I just, there, there was language a couple of times where it was like the city was going to go in and take down your tree. Well, no, this, this is this is a process that occurs. Oh, yes, so uh, assuming that's yep. what the, the homeowner agrees yep. to and everything yep. else. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yep. Yes, yep. thanks. Just Sorry for the lack of clarity on yep. just my part. Just wanted to clarify in case somebody was watching was confused by yes, it. Yes, yes, uh, nobody wants to take it. I hate the fact that we're taking trees down at all, which is why I'm still hoping we can get a replacement tree gifted to these folks if they take advantage of it. Got it. All right, thank you. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I agree with a lot with uh, what Council Member D'Alessandro um, has said, but I do like the proposed the four tier because I, I don't think it, it could be encouraging to a resident to say, oh, I could just stretch this out over 10 years and then um, we are acting kind of like a bank then. And so uh, I do like that it encourages, it has the tiers to allow flexibility if people need it, but it isn't there to encourage people to use us like that. Um, and I know debt is a huge uh, issue in this country and I'm sure in, in this city as well and that's not something that I want to uh, encourage or, or support uh, for our residents here because uh, I know what debt does and how it limits that upward mobility and growth and so uh, I do like the proposed tiering. Councilmember Lohman? <clears throat> well, maybe the only person but I I don't like the tiering. <laughs> um, I, I do think that uh, there's some additional. I mean, if you get to the point where you you got to use the city to do it, uh, you know, I think you really are hard up. Um, and so I, I would like to see. Um, but you know what? We got to start somewhere. Um, but uh, you know, I think you know right now we've got one year at eight um, percent. You know, most of those things are falling <laughs> within that. So my question would be. Well, we just keep the one year and <laughs> move on with it. So I, I think that uh, uh, you know, just from you know the experiences I've had, I had a couple of folks who, who come to me, uh, you know, and you know, happen to just have a, a private sector person who could who could get it in much cheaper than than what uh, the city could do because what they were quoting because uh, they had multiple trees and they had a uh, you know single parent family and they were trying to figure out you know, <laughs> how to pay for this stuff and get it down in that one year term and that was a significant. Uh, 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 issue uh, for them, and it, and it wasn't really a you know a debt issue unless they want to guess put it on a credit card. So, um, uh, which would be significantly higher than you know as eight percent or a or a six point five percent. So um, I just think for some residents, and I, and I guess you know we're just talking about this now. I'd like to see uh, staff have a, an equity and inclusion um, review of this to see. How this impacts those those um, homeowners um, and those folks who are um, you know struggling the most within the city. I don't know if there's a way to even do that, but um, how this how this would would impact them. So um, you know maybe there's no impact at all. Maybe we should just keep it the way it is. So I think that um, so what I'm hearing is a, a couple of things. I'm hearing that the, the tiering structure. I think people agree with. It's just a matter of you know moving the moving the, the levels here and there. Uh, I've heard from a couple of folks that they're, they're good with the four and we could talk about this. But to maybe get an assessment done, run it through the, the, the race, race and equity and, and the whole equity process that we do to make sure that we're okay with that. And I do like Councilmember D'Alessandro's idea and if we could somehow tie this in with tree replacement, I mean, we, we can do it at city cost, but I think there's also, there are programs that we could apply for as well um, grant programs that could help us and, and get our feet on the ground if we wanted to do this and especially with we know in the coming years the number of ash trees that are going to come down are pretty significant so if we could have either at low or no cost tree replacement for folks that would do this um, that, that are looking at this it would be if we could tie it into this somehow I think it'd be very helpful and again ideally I, I'm sure there's got to be grant programming out there somewhere for, for tree removal and urban reforestation for this. Mayor and Council, currently I believe Habitat for Humanity has um, a grant program that first come first serve that um, I think we've been pushing out um, for people that have been contacting us um, okay. for them to work through that piece first to see if they can get their tree down. Okay, so do you have enough information here Council? Are we comfortable with the feedback we've provided? We'll come back and we'll have this discussion mm -hmm. in the future. 
it's coming up soon, sometime soon. So very End good. Of May. End of May. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item five. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keel. Thanks, Carl. Item 5.4 under organizational business is an update on our 98th Street study. And I see Mr. Roberts from our engineering department, and I think he's brought a guest along as well from Bolton and Mank, and I'll let you introduce that uh, your guest for us and kick off this whole su subject for us. Thanks. Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you. Um, Kirk Roberts, traffic and transportation engineer from the city. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, I'm from the engineering department in public works. I'm here on behalf of the city engineer, Julie Long, who's also here, and then Carl Keel, who's with us out there in the ether. The 98th Street study that we're, uh, is underway right now starts out at James Avenue, just off of the corner of City Hall here, extends over the 35W uh, and terminates at Lindale Avenue. The uh, interchange at 35W and 98th Street has always been recognized as a somewhat key interchange in the city. Uh, it's also, from a transportation perspective, and as it relates to land use, it's, it's quite critical too. Um, in recent years, it's also grown as a, trans as a transit hub. So there was a long-term plan for the 98th Street at 35W interchange developed in the 1990s. And that's what we're looking at here. North is oriented to the top. Um, part of that interchange has been built. Uh, the, the ramps on the upper right-hand side or upper left-hand side are existing. The lower right are planned. And that's what brings us to the study. So this document was prepared. This study was done. It was adopted by the county, the city, uh, and the state as well. And so it's sort of the standing plan for the interchange. Once that plan was done, the city and Met Council started to acquire parcels in that area to develop those ramps in conjunction with the long-term plan. In the meantime, Metro Transit used a few of those lots for, for some transit operations. That transit use has grown over the years to become what we now know as the 98th Street Transit Station. It's a very successful transit station. It's one of two key transit facilities in the city of Bloomington. The, um, just recently, uh, this became one of two stops for the Orange Line bus rapid transit system that runs through the city uh, between Burnsville and downtown Minneapolis. It also serves as a transfer point for numerous local routes, including those that serve Normandale Community College, Old Shakopee Road, the amenities on Lindale, Nicolette, and just all over the city. So it's a, it's a pretty significant transit hub. Um, so thinking about putting freeway ramps through that transit hub is uh, whatever they were thinking in the 90s I think we have a different perspective on that interchange now and we need to come up with a different plan so that brings us to the study we're looking to see if we obviously preserving that transit use is a key thing but not just preserving it perhaps enhancing it one of the things that Metro Transit's interested in doing and as well as the Bloomington HRA is envisioning some transit oriented development for the area and how that would translate into this area would be multifamily housing above the transit station. This would be suited towards a transit dependent population. It's a, an area that's not well served and, and so there's interest in, from both the Bloomington HRA and Met Transit in seeing if something like that's possible. Um, another key consideration is the uh, Lindale Avenue retrofit plan, which uh, for those of you who re remember that a couple years ago, envisions this area uh, as suitable for higher density housing that's built upwards, um, increasing density. Can we, can this interchange handle the traffic from that and the density coming from that, uh, as well as we want to see if it can serve non-motorized populations, hiker, uh, walkers, bikers, and things like that better than it does now. Um, and then, so just in brief, the study goals are to develop a long-term plan for the interchange that preserves and enhances the transit at the station, identify near and long-term changes to improve conditions for non-motorized users all throughout the corridor, including the crossing here at 98th Street and Old Shakopee Road. Uh, there's some issues there that people are probably familiar with. Improve safety for all users. And one of the things we've really looked hard at is engaging with uh, the um, communities that are not traditionally served, we don't often hear from in these studies and really work hard to engage with that. So to do that work, we um, brought on Bolton and Mink. Um, 
And we've got a good set of partners on here that have been engaged as this study has advanced forward. That includes the Minnesota Department of Transportation, Hennepin County, Metro Transit, Met Council, the HRA planning, and so on. And they've all been wonderful partners. Um, to talk about the details of the study, I brought forth Brian Nemeth from Boltman Mink. I don't want to steal Brian's thunder, but the answer to the question is, yes, this interchange can do all those things um, into the future. And we've got plans to do that. So to talk about those, Brian Nemeth. Good evening, Mr. Nemeth. Welcome. Thank you. I'll just kind of forward on here. I'll uh, just give you a, bit, a little bit of a background on the corridor. Um, so for first things, looking at the study is, you know, what are the ter different operations that we have on the corridor? Um, what is the safety of the corridor? There have been a number of pedestrian and bicyclist crashes. Um, you'll notice there that there have been four bicyclist crashes at DuPont Avenue and 98th Street. Um, those primarily have been involving an eastbound right turning vehicle or a northbound right turning vehicle. Um, so we know that Pedestrians and bicyclists use this corridor and they have trouble um, navigating the corridor. Additionally, we um, engage with the community to understand what are, are the concerns and what issues they have on the corridor and understanding where they have um, wishes and how they want to see this corridor change in the future. So initially we developed some concepts and there was a lot going on in this, this slide. Um, we looked at kind of three areas of the corridor. The first one was focusing on the west, on Old Shakopee Road near the railroad here, um, and including up over to City Hall. The second area was looking at the I-35W interchange and DuPont Avenue. And the third one was looking at Lindale Avenue. So each, individually looking at each one of these intersection areas and developing uh, approximately five concepts at each one of these to see what the public likes and to understand um, what the concerns are and does it meet some of the concerns that they had. So engagement activities to date, um, we started in the last summer um, with um, some focused conversations, pop-up events at the um, farmer's market, also at the transit station, uh, meeting with some of the community groups that traditionally aren't um, one of the ones that would um, go to the open houses and other events to understand what they see on the corridor, um, what their concerns were. And then we had an open house in December, again, presenting these different intersection concepts and understanding, you know, what did they see? What did they have concerns about? Um, and then we also had some online comment period um, with that open house in December. We know that weather sometimes can be an issue and having a good um, online comment period would um, enhance what we're providing to everybody. Um, let me give a little more information on that. We did have that open comment period for about four weeks. We had 750 people online have visited the website. Um, over that time period, we did have 90 different people um, engage and provide comments either at the open house or at online. Um, this, has been, this has been very good. This is a, a um, much more engagement than usually we see on a lot of these studies. So this is a good um, that we're getting people out there and that people are recognizing um, what's available to them. Um, we will have another open house uh, coming up here in May, um, the beginning of May, that we'll also be presenting some more of this information to. Um, through those open houses and through the online engagement, we want to kind of like consolidate some of the information that we had um, of what the major concerns were on the corridor. Um, looking on the west end of the corridor near the railroad, um, looking at where the old Shakopee Road and um, 98th Street meet, um, a lot of concern about eliminating that northbound merge. So currently the traffic on Old Chalkbee Road has to merge down from two lanes to one as they make that free right turn. And then con concurrently with that, they also re there's a weaving um, occurs that from that right turn, if you wanna go northbound on 35W, that you need to weave across all those lanes before DuPont Avenue, um, which causes a lot of uh, traffic friction in that area. Um, there's also concerns with pedestrians about a signalized crossing. Currently, there is no signalized crossing between James Avenue and DuPont Avenue. It's a complete dead zone. There are also bus stops in between those two areas. So we know that there's been an interest of trying to provide at least another crossing in that area. Um, along with that, we also have, you know, the long-term vision for trying to provide some more increased pedestrian and bicycle space. Um, a little bit of controversy, a little bit of um, question between different groups of like, where do you put that? Do you put it on the north side? Do you put it on the south side? Um, looking at, you know, at least 
primarily on the, the beginning side is looking at on the south side. There's a little more room, a little more right of way available. Um, and also the existing bridge has, ex has a wider sidewalk on that side too. Um, additionally for pedestrians, eliminating some of the channelized right turns. So the southbound right channelized turns coming off the freeway, um, high speed vehicles come off there at a high speed, um, don't necessarily looking, not looking for pedestrians. Can we bring that up close to the intersection? Can we get rid of that? Um, same kind of thing applies at Lindale Avenue. We have three of the four corners also have free rights. Um, again, you have a higher speed of vehicle that kind of comes on there. Pedestrians are not protected at all. Um, is there a way that we can reduce that, those speeds and improve those pedestrian crossings? Um, with that, we also have some of those free rights at the freeway interchange. Again, can we you know, slow down vehicles? Can we make it a little bit easier for pedestrians to cross those, even though they're there? Um, and then at Lindale Avenue, looking at you know, um, getting rid of those free rights, but then also shortening the pedestrian crossings. Currently, pedestrians have, have complained about the long pedestrian wait times that they have to have um, to cross, especially 98th Street, but also some um, comments have been on Lindale Avenue. Then additionally, with any of those changes that we're making, make sure that we're maintaining capacity and mobility. Um, people see that there's a lot of traffic that needs to get through that intersection at Lindale Avenue. Um, and they're close to other intersections, other signalized intersections, that if we don't maintain some mobility at that intersection, we don't want to make sure that doesn't affect the other intersections around there. So not only looking at existing conditions, we're also looking at future conditions, um, looking at development and redevelopment opportunities. Um, Looking at the Lindale retrofit plan um, that would be on the northwest corner here of Lindale and 98th Street, looking at potential redevelopment in that shopping mall area, the car dealership area over the long term. Also looking at, again, that Kirk had mentioned at the transit station, looking at adding some potential um, parking ramp for transits and commercial, some um, apartments there. And then also looking at, you know, there's a lot of um, pedestrian, some a lot of parking lot space that's unused in the Festival Foods parking lot, um, that there is a potential that there could be some development there. So we wanted to make sure that we're accounting for potential redevelopment, not to say that there's something planned, um, that there's something um, on the short-term horizon, but we wanna make sure that we're accounting for that. And so we're accounting for those traffic increases that could be there. Through those initial um, intersection concepts um, and the comments that we received, and again, what the area concerns are, we developed in the two midterm kind of corridor concepts. So this is looking at, you know, what are the th two concepts at each one of these different intersection areas that kind of rose to the top that were more acceptable to the agencies that were reviewing them, um, that would also solve the problems that everybody was looking at. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. There's a lot in there but we can if anybody wants to go into that. So we have two different little concepts here. Again, we're, what we're gonna look at is refining these concepts, going through with the agencies a little bit more, understanding what kind of right of way impacts we'd have with these um, and kind of going through that. Um, in addition, we have a long-term corridor concept. If you look at, and I forgot to mention that, on the midterm concepts is really keeping the existing bridge the way it is. Um, MnDOT has done some rehab on that bridge um, quite a few years in the past, but they still consider uh, the bridge life to be about 20 to 30 years currently. Um, so that bridge is going to, is anticipated to be around for a little bit for at least by MnDOT. Um, and we understand that there are some, some limitations to it. There is not enough right room on there for pedestrians, especially on the north side of the bridge, um, and how that affects um, this whole interchange concept. So the original interchange concept said we need to add more ramps, well, we'll need to rebuild the bridge to, to um, add those ramps, but we're really not going to increase the capacity of the actual bridge. Um, so it's just to make it longer, make it higher so that ramps can get underneath it. Um, so this is looking at, you know, if we need to keep this bridge around, what can we do on the outside of that? And then long term is looking at replacing that bridge. So if they're going to have to replace the bridge anyways for another project, could we replace this bridge and add the capacity that those ramps would initially provide? And then additionally with this, we would, this the area in purple would be the areas which that midterm, so anything you build under, you know, a shorter time period can also be applied to a longer term um, project. So that if you come through with a project later and just replace the bridge, 
try to keep it in between DuPont and really Aldrich um, on, your, on your limits. So next steps, we'll go through a public agency critical review with that's at Hennepin County Public Works actually later this week. Um, we'll determine that preferred concept. Um, with those preferred <coughs> concepts, we'll get those onto the website, so both a midterm and a long term. We'll refine those preferred, that preferred concept um, based on some public comments and also other agency comments that we get. And then we'll have a final concept. Um, we'll present the final concept to the public. We currently have an open house um, preliminary scheduled for the beginning of May. Um, we'll be getting that out here real soon. Um, and then we'll have the final study to HRA and the city council in the summer. And just to provide a summary, um, all the concepts that we have so far um, achieve the study, goal, study and project goals provide a long-term plan for the interchange um, that does not require um, a, a acquiring that property um, from Metro Transit for those ramps, um, preserving and enhancing that transit station, maintaining vehicular mobility, including transit, um, enhancing non-motorized traffic safety, especially across the entire corridor from City Hall all the way to Lindale Avenue, um, providing, provide, improving safety for all users, so providing less time that the um, that there's conflicts between uh, pedestrians and the vehicles, and then allowing for traffic growth, growth due to development and redevelopment in the area. And then eventually replace that 98th Street Bridge over I-35W. So any questions? <laughs> Lot to go through there really quickly. And, and you did a very nice job. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate the information. I appreciate also uh, everything that you went through uh, checked a, a box in my mind thinking, yeah, you gotta eliminate the weave if you're gonna, from that, Old Jacopy Road to get over to go north on the freeway, or the uh, uh, that you know just that mess that goes on there every single morning and backs everything up. Uh, the risk to pedestrians. I've I've tried to to get from my house to the transit station both on foot and on bicycle, and it's white knuckle the whole way mm. trying to get there. So to do that, it, it all makes good sense. So I appreciate everything that you've done. It seems to me everything that you brought up in the in your findings here it makes good sense, and I appreciate the thought that has gone into this. Uh, I am curious, you, you had a slide there with the partners that you've been working with, I appreciate that as well. Curious to hear what the, the feedback or the reactions have been from uh, MnDOT regarding the bridge possibility and our friends at Met Transit regarding the, uh, the park and ride, uh, what they're thinking and what their long-term visions are, not only for that site, but also even bigger picture and where this would fit in, in their priority list. Yep, um, I can speak to, to MnDOT. MnDOT, I mean, I, if, if you've dealt with MnDOT a lot lately versus what you've had dealt with them in the past, um, MnDOT is much more open to, you know, providing and improving these facilities, especially pedestrian facilities. Their ADA group has been up front and center um, providing comments. MnDOT does currently have a plan to replace the two traffic signals um, at the interchange. Um, with that, they did indicate that MnDOT ADA has not commented on it, and some of these potential improvements that we're propose, proposing here could possibly be implemented by MnDOT as part of that, those projects. Um, so MnDOT has been very acceptable to it. Met Council has been one of the ones that has been really making sure that on a regional basis that, you know, that plan for those ramps, um, make sure that if, if those ramps aren't needed, make sure that we can show that it can be, can be met with other improvements um, as we're looking at replacing that bridge in the long-term future and make sure that that's consistent with it, what they're looking at. And then Metro Transit, um, comments have been so far is that, you know, the, they are looking at the north end of that site of doing some potential, you know, open to potential redevelopment there. Um, do want to make sure they do have some parking there for uh, park and ride, because they do realize that people do use that for park and ride too. Thank you. Council questions, comments? Council Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, summary of a lot of things that are going on there. I really do appreciate uh, you know, both uh, from staff and, and from yourself there uh, in, a, in an area that uh, is really a, a place where just about almost every Bloomington resident uh, kind of uh, makes their way across the city. It's really a connecting uh, uh, place for everyone to go. And so as, as I look at that, and I, I assume now that since we're at the beginning stages of this, uh, that, that staff will you know look at how sustainability will be uh, woven and, and placed into this um, as well. Um, and then um, I'm always curious, and I always ask about roundabouts, if there's any way to, <laughs> I know I get a little chuckle there, <laughs> um, uh, out of that. And again, you don't need to answer that now. That, that can come much later on. I don't want to 
want to want to uh, build that time. Uh, I also uh, my understanding was that that 35W bridge, the section that we have there, is that similar to the to the the construction that was uh, that was replaced uh, further up on 35, the one that collapsed. Um, someone had told me that at some point in time that that was a similar bridge construction, um, but uh, maybe maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe it's a different bridge they're talking about. I'm just was curious about that and if that's going to be at all in this longer concept replaced uh, at any point? Um, not that I know of. Um, I'm not sure the similarities with other bridges that we have. Uh, one thing that did show up during our study, we did look at the existing bridge structure out there. Actually, there's there's two spans out there, one's for westbound and one's for eastbound. They are actually at different levels, um, so which makes any kind of, we were looking at potentially trying to bridge the gap between them and try to provide, you know, move the median or anything like that and realize that both bridge structures are actually at different elevations and requires, since they would have different settling um, abilities there, that any retrofit of the existing bridge um, to kind of change what's going to happen on the westbound or eastbound, it makes it very difficult. Um, so that's one thing we did find out with the bridge. And then again, looking at some of those bridge reports that MnDOT indicated that, you know, rehab that they have done um, in the past that they still anticipate that 30, that 20 to 30 year life. Okay. That was my question. What was yep. the lifespan of that? Okay. That's it. Thank you. Council, additional questions, comments? All right. Well, appreciate the work that's gone into this so far. And I appreciate also the, uh, public engagement that's coming up, the outreach and engagement. I think that'll be an important part and, uh, we'll do our part as well to do what we can. And I just let the, City Manager know that this is going to be a topic of the Council Minute, so Mr. Roberts, you might be doing some editing for me. We're going to try and put this together, so this makes good sense. But I appreciate uh, the, the input there, and I appreciate all of the details. Thanks much. Thank you. Council, our final item tonight is item 5.5, our City Council Policy and Issue Update. Uh, I'll kick it off reviewing what we heard in our uh, listening session earlier this evening. Uh, we met... Grant Wietenheimer, and Grant is a uh, longtime Bloomington resident who was uh, starting his own food truck business, and he's the scrambling egg, and he actually handed out stickers and, and menus and so on, which I appreciated a lot. He had some questions. First of all, he wanted to introduce himself and, and say hello, which I thought was very cool of him. I liked that a lot. We learned more about his business, and then he had some questions about uh, specific distance requirements from residential areas that we put into our food truck ordinance for a variety of reasons, whether it was food or, or aroma or that kind of thing. And he just wanted to talk more about that. And actually, it was a good conversation. And, and I'm glad he came forward. And I'm glad we had a chance to meet him and talk to him a little bit. So um, thanks, Grant, for being there this evening. We heard from Ms. Sally Ness regarding, uh, she had a question about the uh, lack, uh, she had comments, actually, regarding the lack of the Development Review Committee action uh, on Northwestern Health Sciences code changes. And it was explained to her at the last meeting that we had that there was no development review committee overview of this because it was not a development. In fact, it was a code change. That's why it, it occurred the way it did. We were simply following the way it always has followed. And had it been a development, there would have been a DRC uh, action. The fact that it was a code change, there was not. And then we talked to uh, Kim Velasovich and Laura Hunt. Uh, they. Uh, were in the uh, audience and actually I think spoke a couple weeks ago when we had our public hearing regarding the proposed zoning changes. And uh, they were asking about next steps and, and where we were headed with that. Explained to them that we were, uh, that we will take that up again on May 1st. And uh, we will, as a council, be looking at the different options. The plan right now is uh, that we've had two public hearings on the issue and we likely won't be opening up another public hearing. This is a council discussion and that um, it'll be a conversation among the council to try and figure out how we get to where we're going to get one way or the other. And uh, they, they appreciated the update, and I think we're understanding of what, we, what we're trying to do and, and what um, appreciated also the work that we've done on it so far and, and trying to include as many people and make it as open and as transparent as possible. So those were our three folks who came forward during the council listening session. Once again, a, a, a good, good evening, a good session, good feedback. Uh, as we move into our policy and issue update council, I'll, I'll kick it off also. So last week, uh, council member Lohman, council member D'Alessandro and Mr. Verbrugge and I were in Washington for the National League of Cities uh, Congressional City Conference. And it's a yearly uh, conference that 
Uh, it's just basically a, a legislative update of what's going on at the national level, at the federal level, and how it affects cities, what we can do from an advocacy standpoint, and it gives us an opportunity to get in the offices of our federal representatives. And uh, it was nice to go with a, a group of four as we have had the opportunity, I think, in the past couple of years, because we strategically broke up and attended most of the sessions. We covered most of the sessions, came away with a lot of good information, and I'll, I'll let the different council members, if they want to jump in about specifics that they learned or things that they brought back, uh, it, because it, it was worthwhile. We had a chance to get together with our League of Minnesota Cities counterparts uh, on a lot of issues. Uh, we also had a chance to talk to, uh, in, in different congressional offices, on a variety of issues. We managed to get into uh, Council Member, or excuse me, Congressman Phillips' office and, and met with his staff members. And we also uh, met with, Council, uh, with Senator Klobuchar individually and had a good conversation with her. And then individually on the topic of the expo, Mr. Verbrugge and I had the opportunity to meet with uh, council, with I keep calling them the council members, with Congressman Emmer's staff and had a good conversation. As we brought forward and talked about in the past, uh, Congressman Emmer has been a big supporter of Expo and, in fact, was the author of the legislation back in 2017 to get the United States back in the Bureau of International Expositions. He's a big supporter of Expo and I appreciate all the work that he has done and the uh, support that he has put forward for Expo. Also had a chance to meet with folks um, from the State Department. And so we went over to the Eisenhower building and had a good conversation with uh, folks at the State Department, as well as a meeting, a presentation to the board of directors of the Sister Cities International Board. And they were very enthusiastic about the possibility. They asked how Sister Cities could be more involved. We told them we already had the connection through Sister Cities through one of their board members and had tried and we started to develop that relationship and that um, that network throughout the country based on our work, and they, they certainly were willing to help even more. And uh, from the small world file, uh, one of the board members, uh, I, I, I kind of kicked it off, introduced Mr. Verbrugge, sat back down, and it was a, he, a, an older gentleman, a little bit older than me, and in the first two minutes, he kind of leaned over to me and said, I was a bat boy the first year the twins were in Minnesota. <laughs> small world file, you always run into somebody who's got a connection one way or another. So. All in all, it was, uh, it was a very, I think, effective and, and worthwhile and fruitful trip to D.C. regarding both city business in particular, specifically to uh, the Expo as well. We had, a, we had good conversations all over. I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Verbrugge to talk a little bit about our then, we went from Washington to Paris to participate in the Bureau of International Expositions Symposium regarding Expo, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Jamie on this one. Jamie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Members. Uh, we had a, a, a good representation of the Bloomington Council uh, attending the event in, in Paris, in addition to the Mayor, Council Members Martin, and D'Alessandro, and uh, Carter, along with our Community Development Director and me. Uh, the reason that we were there is this is the uh, last uh, last opportunity to get in front of uh, a good number of the delegates at the same time prior to the vote that's going to occur on June 21st. And so uh, we had a couple of activities in Paris. Uh, the first evening there was a reception at the ambassador's residence. Uh, the United States ambassador to France hosted uh, many of the diplomatic corps in Paris. Over 250 people were attending there. Uh, that event was uh, very successful, gave uh, our group from Minnesota and Washington, D.C., which included about 40 people, uh, maybe close to 50, the opportunity to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, delegates and uh, diplomats and a uh, number of other folks uh, and uh, really talk about why the United States would be an excellent location for Expo 2027. Uh, and then the next day at the symposium that was hosted by the Minnesota Expo Bid Committee, uh, we spent more time expounding on the theme of the Expo, Healthy People, Healthy Planet. Uh, we convened breakout uh, sessions with the delegates who were attending, and that was actually a uh, very well-received um, uh, format in that it gave the delegates an opportunity to have input into what the U.S. program would look like, which is different from our understanding of how other uh, at, uh, candidates had conducted their symposium, where it was a lot of one-way conversation, uh, just information sharing. Uh, we were very intentional about 
uh, engaging in conversation and getting feedback about how other countries would like to participate, what theme elements resonated with them, uh, and what they would like to see as part of the programming. And that seemed to be very well received by the delegates as well. Uh, the mayor and I also had a follow-up meeting with another State Department representative before we left. Uh, all things considered for a very short uh, trip, uh, very <laughs> intensive over a couple days, I think it was a successful delegation. And uh, we're looking forward to June. We do have a number of other things we're continuing to work on. The State Department is very active in the closing 10 weeks here before the vote will occur. Uh, our bid committee is coordinating very closely with them. We continue to work with our uh, legislators uh, to be ready to go in the event that the United States is selected. And um, we are, uh, we're making progress. So I'm going to stop there, Mr. Mayor. Any, happy to answer any questions on either the D.C. or the uh, Paris front. Uh, and, and I'd be happy to answer any questions as well, but I'd also look for input specifically regarding either D.C. or Paris, and then we can move on to other topics as well. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, um, I appreciated the opportunity to be involved in both of those uh, trips, specifically as it relates to the D.C. trip. Um, I spent time... Uh, understanding the opportunities for um, grants and uh, allocations out of the major, uh, you know, initiatives that have come out of the administration um, at the federal level, um, specifically talking about um, access to broadband. We're in a unique situation here as a first-year suburb in that, you know, a lot of focus on rural, a lot of focus on um, uh, closing some gaps. Uh, but, you know, when I look at the broadband infrastructure uh, that we have, it's um, it's you know not uh, not where it should be for a first tier suburb either. And so we have folks who are priced out of affordable uh, broadband and also um, have very limited choices when it comes to to the options that they have. And so um, happy to see some of of that stuff and have some follow up to do there. Uh, in addition to that, uh, really interesting conversations about um, some of the um, uh, um, uh, creativity going on in what I would call uh, small scale or they call artisanal manufacturing. So when we think about our transition nodes, um, Lindo, uh, uh, Retrofit and other places like that, there's opportunities and uh, there were great examples in places like uh, Durham, uh, Durham, North Carolina and um, um, I forget exactly where outside of Mass outside of Boston and Massachusetts, where they talked about um, how how to leverage those um, those areas as a means not only to spur small business um, growth, but also to kind of enable that transition from a, a residential area or or a retail area into what would be a more industrial area. And it spoke very much to some of the layout areas we have there. And so uh, I was able to connect um, Ms. Henderson with uh, some of the, the information that I received there too. Um, so, uh, and of course, th thirdly, there is um, on on the notion of of, of climate, um, there are there there you know there is just a continuing focus on ensuring that we have um, all of our cities moving towards um, uh, you know sus uh, sustainability, but also you know, mitigation strategies and things like that. So very happy to add my voice to yours, Mr. Mayor, um, and 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 to Councilmember Lomans to talk to our legislators about things like. Um, our, our projects like uh, replacing the well uh, down at 84th Street uh, and that kind of thing to kind of focus on those efforts as well. So hoping we'll get all that done. Um, as it relates to Paris, um, my favorite thing about Paris, uh, the meetings in Paris was um, that I felt very strongly, I confidently could say to folks, um, thank you for your input. Now when you come to 2027 and you see what we've done, you'll be able to draw a direct line from the conversations we had to the work that we're working on together in the expo. And I think that that's really important. I um, making sure people feel like their voices are heard um, and, and that we're not here to tell them as the United States what should be happening in a place like, um, you know, Zambia, for example. I, I was able to meet with that person and um, the, the delegate at the time, and um, we spoke to people in the, from the Philippines and, the, and Cameroon and Palau and all over the world to, to understand they have unique challenges, but they also have very similar issues as it relates to healthy people 
And most importantly, that not a single person I talked to said, oh, you can have healthy people without a healthy environment. They know that climate change uh, work and sustainability work is inextricably linked. Clean water, uh, access to food, uh, that you know, inven in inventions in food and things like that were also very, very important and, and critical uh, as we think about healthy people. So um, I, I think we did a great job. I'm so grateful for my colleagues. Um, and um, I think, um, well, I'll just put it this way. I, I think a lot of people don't think that the expo is a good idea on a lot of, number of fronts. I get that. Um, happy to talk to every single one of them because I have lots of reasons to be hopeful about the expo doing good things for people and good things for our planet. Thanks. Councilmember Mayor Malone. Um, you know, thank you, uh, Mayor and uh, uh, Councilman D'Alessandro. Um, <clears throat> you know, oftentimes when I think about, uh, you know, our, our mission that um, – not only uh, that some of our council members served on, but also the community that came forward. And we talk about trying to cre create that remarkable community where everyone wants to be. Uh, I, I think it's important that we take upon <clears throat> Uh, these opportunities to gain education um, and, and because we as as leaders don't necessarily have the answers uh, to those things and I think the mayor kind of referred to this and that's why we we network and we go to DC and, and, and other cities uh, to, to ask those questions of those who are subject matter experts um, in those areas uh, to try to challenge ourselves as council members and to make ourselves better over the over the many years that I've had the opportunity uh, to participate uh, in those opportunities, um, I, I really uh, think that I've grown as a council member and, and had the opportunity to have a better understanding of how we can try to achieve our strategic priorities. Um, because I think there's there's a real question about, about about that, and I just wanted to just kind of just say that for myself, I think that's been a, a, an awesome opportunity. You know, I took many classes while I was there. Um, you know, there's smart city ones, and there's there's other ones. But one of the ones that uh, you know that the manager encouraged me to take. Um, was challenges that that uh, that women face as leaders, and and I think that you know as we kind of move into um, uh, becoming the, the, a remarkable city uh, that everyone wants to to, to be in, uh, we've got to to look at some of these cleavages and these things that that make it difficult for for those folks who have voices and want to be able to share uh, in. Uh, making the city what we want it to be and, and for us to, to, to be trained in those things. And so I, I'm just glad that I had that opportunity uh, to be there and take that class. Um, and, and I think it's, it's going to make me, a, you know, <laughs> it just doesn't take right away. It takes over time uh, that you can kind of improve some of the things that, that, that you do. And then with respect to, I didn't have the opportunity to go to the expo, but I did have a lot of opportunity to network with a lot of folks. And let me tell you, Every person that I talked to uh, from across the country, uh, they said, wow, if my city had the opportunity to have the expo, to showcase what we are as a city for the entire planet, to be able to have that opportunity to come here, I, I mean, I don't know <laughs> what, other, what, other, what other thing you can do. Um, and if, if we're moving forward with, with our strategic priorities and, and just that space that needs to be redone, I can't think of a better opportunity. So um, sorry I went a little bit long here, but I just, uh, I'm really excited about our future. Um, and I think that includes, uh, you know, whatever happens with the expo. And I think it, it also, you know, I encourage other council members, if you've got the opportunity to do that, to, to participate uh, in those trainings, I think it, it would, would help us in terms of our overall goals that we're trying to achieve here. Thank you, council members. Mr. Berberugi, I think that was a good summary, I think, of what we had going on. Appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Mr. Mayor, in, uh, in addition to uh, this report, uh, I'd like the assistant city manager to provide a quick legislative update for council. Mr. Sable. Uh, thank you, Mayor and council members. The, uh, the legislature is officially on uh, spring break, uh, so they're off the rest of this week. And there are only five weeks left. Uh, in this session, which is hard to believe because it's it, it's coming up quickly. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, much of the work that has been done in the committees has already wrapped up. Um, the city staff and, and uh, council members and acting mayor and mayor have all provided testimony for bonding requests, uh, expo funding for 
uh, Bloomington Central Station, TIF extension, uh, public health components, and then the Bloomington sales tax request. And so we've been a, a constant presence at the Capitol. I want to appreciate uh, Katie Sen, our lobbyist, for, for her work. Uh, the number of text messages we get at all hours of the, of the day and night is wonderful. And so she's been a terrific partner. But we are now moving into the section of the omnibus bills. And this is often the time where all of the small individual bills get lumped together into these broad uh, behemoths, uh, usually numbering in the hundreds of pages for each one. And so we're continuing to monitor each of them as they come through. Um, I will say that the one uh, items that we tend to watch for the most are tends to be the tax bill and the bonding bill. And those are always the ones that they put out after the uh, spring break session. So we won't know what's in those bills ultimately until maybe April 10th or 11th. And then that's when the, the, the real work begins. <clears throat> um, we do know that uh, we are included in the bonding bill for $1.8 million for the uh, public health building for design uh, dollars specifically. And then I will note that we've had a several requests yet this week for more information related to the Bloomington Ice Garden. And so um, we do know that the bonding bill will likely grow. And that kind of movement is, gives an indication that we might be included at some portion for the Bloomington Ice Garden. Uh, the legislature must end on by May 22nd at the latest, and so we will continue to monitor. Uh, our Bloomington delegation has been um, actively in engaged in our work, and so it's, um, it's a good partnership that we have. But uh, with five weeks left to go, we'll be continuing to monitor um, all of our bills in the legislature uh, and providing updates in the one weekly to you on Fridays. Thank you, Mr. Sable. Council, any questions of Mr. Sable? Very good. Council, anything to bring forward as part of our City Council policy and issue update this evening? Former Acting Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Emphasis on former, I believe. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, not uh, uh, any travel or anything, but just wanted to personally thank um, teams from Public Works. Um, as many had, uh, I had a branch on a large tree go down and covered most of my street. And uh, and as people may know, Public Works takes care of getting and removing some branches out. They had a team out uh, during the snowstorm because of the heavy snow. But um, and they did a, they did a fantastic job. They even played with my dog because my dog loves large trucks and vehicles and was outside barking at them. So um, she wanted to help, you know. So just she's helpful that way. <laughs> But um, what I really wanted to do is the the plow driver that came by when uh, it got to my neighborhood, um, she stopped short of the tree, got out, assessed the situation, and actually took the time to drive around the block and came the other direction and pushed the tree up against uh, the curb, which is totally appropriate to make sure the road's passable, but did it in front of my yard instead of the other direction where it would have been in front of my driveway. And just for her to have taken that little bit of time and thoughtfulness just showed, I think, the dedication of our team, our plow drivers and things like that. I know it's been a long winter. I know there's piles of snow blocking views and things like that, but the team just, I mean, when they can, they seem to always go that extra little bit, and it's those little touches that um, I think need to be recognized and just wanted to thank, and if uh, Carl's still there somewhere, he doesn't need to jump on, but if he can just make sure that message gets to the individual um, that, that did that, uh, it was very much appreciated by my family, especially since my wife had the SUV and was in uh, Rochester, and I was stuck with her Mini Cooper, which was <laughs> less than ideal in this last snowstorm. So, um, again, just great job, um, as always. And those little things um, just go so far. And, and, you know, let's be honest, I highly doubt she knew I sit on the city council or anything like that. I think she just assessed the situation and made a really good decision to do the right thing for residents. So, thank you. Thank you, council member. Yeah, and that's, uh, they, they do great work and have all winter. Council, anything else? If not, we have completed our agenda and council. I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We got a motion by council member Martin, second by council member Mua to adjourn. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much council for your discussion this evening. Thanks to the staff for bringing things forward and thanks to everybody who's tuned in. Appreciate it. Have a good rest of your week. Thanks.